Children of Ruin by Adrian Tchaikovsky If you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not. William Shakespeare, Macbeth Past One Just Another Genesis One So many stories start with a waking. Dizrasenkovi had been asleep for decades. Something like a lifetime passed back home while he slumbered. A fraction of a lifetime passed around his oblivious form. The time span squeezed down the relativity gradient by his proximity to the speed of light. For him, though, there was no time. Nothing but the oblivion of the cold sleep chamber. They knew how to build them back in those days. Senkovi chose the manner of his waking. Some of his colleagues, those he thought of as less imaginative, would let themselves be fed crucial mission information, news from home, metrics from the ship, so they could spring from cold sleep with a mind full of data, ready to leap to their stations and steal a march on the day. Ludicrous, given the work they had ahead of them would take decades. Senkovi had always been unimpressed by most of his colleagues. Instead, paradoxically, he woke himself with a dream. He hung in the water of a warm, clean coral sea that hadn't existed in that virgin state since long before his birth. The sun filtered down through the waters like an embarrassment of sapphires. Below him, his best guess reconstruction of the vanished Great Barrier Reef extended in multicolored profusion, reds, purples and greens as far as the eye could see, like an alien city. Life whirled about the coral metropolis in a riot of motion, swimming, jetting, drifting, crawling. He turned gently, casting a benign and godlike gaze over his creation, half sleeping, half knowing, so that he felt the joy of having brought this into being, yet not the pain of knowing the original had long predeceased him. At last, one of his special friends signalled its presence, squirming its malleable body from a crevice within the rocks and undulating cautiously towards him. Eyes like and unlike his own regarded him with the sort of ersatz wisdom nature otherwise gave only to owls. It, determining the gender of an octopus was not a task easily performed at this remove, reached an arm towards him. Adam to his divinity, and he let his hand drift outwards slowly to accept that touch. It was a good dream. He programmed it himself creating a complex sequence of mental stimulation that drew on his specific memories and jumbled them into something semi-novel. It was still dreamlike, unreal, but that was what he was aiming for, so fine. He also had to hack the ship computers with considerable ingenuity to make it happen, given that encounters with marine fauna were not on the a la carte menu when choosing a wake-up sequence. The hard part had not been inserting the neurological sequence into the ship's database but erasing all sign of his meddling. By then, he'd been in and out of the mission systems quite a lot without anyone noticing, though. Senkovi had come to the conclusion that the Terraform initiative back home was very, very lax in its digital security, and then shrugged idly and carried on with his own personal tinkering. What, after all, was the worst that could happen? Amongst his travels within the virtual architecture of the mission protocols, Dizra Senkovi had also come face to face with Dizra Senkovi, or at least the crew profile and assessment record of that name. While extreme technical expertise was a given with all crew, he was interested to see the results of his personality assessments. There were two main poles for a multi-decade mission like this, and they pulled in opposite directions. One related to how well a crew member could cope working in isolation for long periods of time, and how they might tolerate being severed from the great mass of humanity in the course of human history. He aced that one. The other related to working in close confinement alongside other human beings he simply could not escape from. And he was dismayed to see how close he had come to rejection on that ground alone. Senkovi felt himself an affable, outgoing man. From the age of nine, he had been working on constructing pseudo-intelligences to have conversations with, and hadn't he, more than anyone else in the crew, surrounded himself with pets back home? What better indication of a warm and loving human nature was there? He'd owned 19 aquariums, three large enough to dive in. 
Many of the aquatic denizens were like close personal friends to him. How could anyone think him antisocial, let alone make all those unfair and hurtful comments? He was being tongue-in-cheek, of course. They meant human friends, and that had never been his strong suit. Still, he had a few, and he worked well in a task-focused environment where everyone was fixed on a common goal. And when it came to R&R, &R, well, if he wasn't the life and soul of the party, at least he didn't step on anybody else's toes. And there was, in his humble opinion, not a human being alive who enjoyed jokes more than he did. It was just that nobody else found his funny. Anyway, his general social inoffensiveness was just sufficient when added to his undeniable competence to get him on the crew. And then some combination of evaluations and computer subroutines kicked him up to be head of the terraforming team, one below overall command, because if he had a slightly deranged genius on the team, it was probably better to let him cox than row. That was the actual comment of the psychologist who recommended the promotion, and Senkovi, having got into that file as well, treasured the perceived compliment. But they needed him awake now. In that unreal ocean, he strained, but the touch of the tentacle never quite reached his finger, and all his pets were long dead and gone on an earth more than 30 light years away. Dizra Senkovi opened his eyes, aware that his beatific smile had crossed over from his dream and was still on his face. He felt refreshed and ready to start his day. A quick interrogation of the ship's systems assured him they had arrived, their long cold journey done, the deceleration over. He sat up, stretching, more for the form of it than from any need, but he was used to doing all sorts of things because people do them, as a sop to the sensibilities of his fellows. He was neither alone in his sleeping compartment, nor surrounded by the bustle of a woken crew. Instead, his performance had an audience of one, Yusuf Baltiel, overall command. Boss, Sengavi acknowledged. The lack of context to Baltiel watching him wake was disconcerting. Sengavi liked to have a handle on cause and effect, and was usually smart enough to avoid surprises. He queried the ship again and found a weight of data embargoed, blocked from him, blocked from everyone except Baltiel himself. That's not good. I need a second opinion, Baltiel told him. Let me guess, the planet's not there? It had been the joke with the very first exoprobes. Sometimes the data said there was an Earth-type planet, but the indicators were just a bunch of other factors conspiring to give that impression. Of course, a probe had actually been shot out here, accelerating far faster than a manned ship could manage, checked that an actual terraformable planet was present, and reported back. They wouldn't just send a manned mission off on a wind now, would they? Senkovi really didn't want to have to turn around and go home. There's a planet. Only now did Senkovi notice the curious tension to Baltiel, a man generally in complete command of himself. He was practically vibrating like a plucked string. There's a planet, he repeated, but there's a problem. I'm keeping it hush for now, but it's too big for me to make the call. I'll need you to see. Because of the embargo, which Senkovi felt was a childish way to go about things, they actually had to walk to overall command to see the thing Baltiel was so agitated about. Everyone else was still peacefully on ice. Who then was all this cloak and dagger supposed to thwart? He kept throwing queries at the system to find out what he could and couldn't know, because the computer wasn't able to tell him what was off limits until he hit a nerve and it clammed up on him. Actual walking from one place to another was, in Zenkabi's book, something the future should have done away with long before, and his legs were having difficulty with the rotational gravity so that he bandy-kneed his way around the edge of the crew ring behind Baltiel's brisk stride. Baltiel was blocking transmission back home, he discovered uneasily, despite the fact that any urgent cry for help Zenkabi might make would take thirty years and change to arrive. It wasn't like he'd be able to hold a murderous Baltiel off for that long, or indeed at all. Just tell me, boss, he complained to the man's back. Baltiel stopped, turned. There was a kind of fervor in his face that made Senkovi flinch. He's found God, was his instant thought, which was all sorts of extra not good, especially considering the most recent news from home. He had idly sifted through the updates while walking, 
All of it was decades out of date, but it looked like Earth had gone through a spot of trouble a while back, with anti-science terrorism and all sorts. They should add you in space, man. I need you to see. It wasn't just mystery for the sake of it. Baltiel had drawn himself up to deliver the revelation, and failed. A hundred more rubbery steps, and they arrived at overall command, where the large screens displayed solar and planetary data and a visual representation of the destination system they had at last achieved. Known as TESS-834, after the long-ago Earth-orbiting satellite that had first picked it out of the firmament. Sankavi started with the big stuff, making sure the star wasn't about to go nova, looking for major disruptions or absences among Tess's 834 B, C and D, the three colossal gas giants that filled out the waste of the virtual orrery and had the privilege of the first few letters because their mass had them detected first by Earth's instruments. Two of them were not much shy of Jupiter for size, one of them quite a bit bigger. Nice meteor screen for our inner worlds, he thought. E and F were further out, rock and ice monsters carving lonely paths in the reaches where the system's sun was little more than one star among many. Of inner worlds, there were three, one of them virtually rolling through the star's upper atmosphere, the other two close neighbours in the broad habitable zone, but as different as siblings could be. Senkabi pulled up more data, still looking for the problem. The outermost of the pair, Tess 834G, was a little smaller than Earth, shining with an icy albedo through a thin atmosphere shorn of greenhouse gases. Any heat thrown its way just bounced right back off and was lost to space. Goldilocks zone or no, any fair-haired visitor was going to find her porridge inedibly frozen, save at high summer around the equator. The other, their target, Tess 834H, was warmer than Earth. Slightly larger, its atmosphere muggy and heat-retaining, jealously hoarding everything the sun threw its way. There was a moon large enough for its gravity to make tides and keep its spin axis stable, and initial scans showed the presence of most elements human life would find useful. All in all, it would be a good match for human habitation once they'd let the terraformers loose on it. They could install a working ecology with a minimum of fuss and then maybe someday people would come and live on it. Or else that crazy lady Khan would arrive and do unspeakable things in the name of science. A lot of the terraforming team were frustrated with their glorious champion and leader Avrana Khan because her priorities did not seem to actually match the mission statement, while Sinkovi was frustrated with her because she was doing all the fun stuff he would have preferred to do. This all looks... good? except it all looked a bit too good, now he mentioned it. Oxygen content on Tess 834H in particular was higher than he would expect. Um, what am I? This was one of the late surveys, Baltiel said over his shoulder. By then they were very focused. They'd given up looking for the other stuff, the left field stuff, the real stuff. He hadn't said it, but Senkovi heard the ghost of the thought in the other man's words. The ship had performed its own survey as it closed in with the TESS-834 system, its instruments far in advance of the old exoprobes, drawing up a detailed picture of the terraforming challenge ahead. The ship itself had not blinked at the data, nor considered that it was making a discovery. Just like the exoprobe, it could only see what it was looking for. Senkovi was having a similar difficulty. He even pulled up the best visual image of the planet, taken by the ship as it zipped past on its way to break around the red-orange sun. A single brown megacontinent, a great ink-coloured sea, spiralling wisps of cloud. This looks ideal terraforming territory, to be honest. But Baltiel just said nothing, and eventually every sound in the room, every shuffle and rustle, fell into the cavernous void of his silence, as he waited for Sinkovi to flip the data like an optical illusion, to see the other side of the story. And eventually, Senkovi stopped looking at the readings like the exoprobe and read them like a human being. And he fell still and silent too. They had come as far from Earth as any human ever had, travelled for a generation, left behind a planet fragmenting into political disarray to gift this distant desert orb with life. But they were too late. 
life was already there. Two. The terraforming vessel had been named the Aegean, which everyone except Senkovi and Boltiel assumed was just one more name from the long electronic list that some computer kept for giving ships inoffensive monikers. Senkovi happened to have hacked the vulnerable part of the data chain and changed the Marata to the Aegean because he preferred it, but no point letting that become public knowledge, not with so much on everybody's minds. The Aegean had a crew of 13, and every one of them was awake now. The ship's data sphere was busy with 11 men and women trying to work out what was going on. Senkovi's preference would be to either just post the information up or not tell them at all. But Boltiel was a showman at heart, and moreover he was about to propose a rather radical departure from their mission. Senkovi, forewarned, was already working on his own counter-proposals, because he had come out here for a reason and didn't much like people messing with his routines, even routines planned out decades in advance. He and Boltiel had been busy prior to waking the others. The Aegean was in stable orbit around Tess 834H, although the data embargo extended to the view screens that otherwise would have given a window-like view of the world below. The two early risers had fabricated a long-range in-atmosphere scout remote for a special mission. Honestly, the most complex part had been thoroughly disinfecting the thing. There were Earth microbes that could survive vacuum and the burn of re-entry, and a century of space industry had created a bizarre new habitat that bacteria and fungi had evolved to inhabit. It wasn't usually a concern of terraformers, whose job was, after all, to seed new planets with as much new life as possible. Boltiel was taking no chances, though. There was a living world out there, and the last thing he wanted was to unleash some microbial apocalypse. So they printed the thing off, built it from the ground up in sterile conditions, coated it with foam, and then vented it out into space, its rubbery armor ablating away until the pristine remote was all that was left untouched by human hands. Then they had sent it into the planet's atmosphere to take a look. Senkovi's imagination was full of algal pools, bacterial mats, stromatolites. The history of life on Earth was one of a long age of primitive single cells, alone or clinging together in makeshift unorganized colonies. Complex life was merely the recent froth over a great vat of prokaryotes, feeding and dividing and dying. That was what they expected to find, a scum of undifferentiated life clinging to the coastlines of that one great continent. Then the remote had gone low enough to start recording images, and they had watched and watched, revising their impressions, glancing at one another. Senkovi had twined his fingers at the implications for his work. Boltiel had been stock still, a man given a destiny. They put the remote into its own orbit and told the ship to wake the others. And here they were, gathered together so Boltiel could draw aside the curtain and show them the magic. You're probably wondering if I've gone mad, he addressed them. In fact, he had been keeping tabs on just what inquiries they had made of the ship's systems, using overall command access to eavesdrop on the conversations fitting between their implants. Some of them did indeed think he'd suffered some breakdown as a result of the cold sleep process, even though that was supposedly impossible with the modern units. Others had been picking up the news from Earth, sifting through all the signals that had chased after the Aegean, and coming to the uncomfortable conclusion that the Earth, as it had been 31 years ago, was in the grip of war in all but name. Was Boltiel about to declare for one side or another? Was he about to accuse some of them of being anti-science quizlings? The conflict brewing back home, the conflict that had been brewing way back when anyway, went further than science versus conservatism, but as they were all scientists, their takes on it were naturally skewed. A number of them had tried to circumvent his embargo, either to glean more information or, in the case of Dr. Irma Lamte, to send a report home. Senkovi, now Boltiel's willing co-conspirator, had been able to thwart them all for the same reasons that poachers make the best gamekeepers. And what Lamte felt a report home would accomplish at this remove was anybody's guess. They were their own little state with 13 citizens, cut off from human progress, marooned on a desert island in a sea the size of the universe. Just watch, Boltiel told them. 
when he had gathered them all in one of the Aegean's briefing rooms and called up his selected excerpts from the remote's travelogue. Coming down from a cloudy, mackerel-striped sky, below was a great reddish-brown bowl, crossed by a couple of mountain chains like half-buried lines of vertebrae, sutures holding the megacontinent together. This was the hot, dry heart of the tropical latitudes, the drone coursing steadily over a dust bowl the size of Asia. At this remove, without magnification, it seemed almost featureless. The point of view dropped, though, as the remote made its controlled descent. Data on altitude, temperature, and the like flickered in constantly shifting footnotes. For a moment it could have been old Mars down there, save for the lack of craters. The world was a desert, terrible, inhospitable, ripe for humanity to build a new Eden. The remote dropped lower, skimming on towards this world's north and east. Ahead there was a line of darkness where night began, and the footage was catching up on it. The view shifted, magnified, jerking to the right. This was Bolteel's post-flight editing, a little clumsy because he was a dreamer but not necessarily an artist. There were lakes in the desert, though of what was unclear. They leapt at the eye from the dull brown expanse, yellow, ferrous red, the blue-green of copper compounds, often concentric rings of one unlikely toxic-looking colour within another, and then another. They looked like waste pools from some factory about to be shut down by the environmental lobby, their shores crusted with glittering crystals. The sight was beautiful, yet a poster child for something inimical to human life. The display recorded a temperature of 61 degrees centigrade. The remote descended further. There was no sound, and indeed the only sound would have been the wind and the rattle of grit and the roar of the machine's air scoops as it fought to stop itself overheating. Someone had been drawing in the dirt around the pools and drawing in the poisonous water too. There were complex radial designs like dark snowflakes that branched and branched and met each other. Bolteel believed these were something like bacterial colonies. Senkavi said they could just as easily be inorganic. But these were the least exciting of the images he wanted the crew to see. A showman, after all. However, he had guessed his audience might be getting slightly restless after looking at an alien desert for almost 30 minutes. The remote's view switched again, looking off towards the marching teeth of one of the mountain ranges, magnifying, zooming until there was a dot there, moving past the face of that red rock. Even with the remote giving them its all, it was hard to see what they were looking at. Something pale moved in the air, and the human eye tried to recast it as a bird, a machine. The remote was closing as fast as it could, chasing the thing down. Now it resembled nothing so much as a filmy plastic bag caught on the wind, dipping and rising. Where the desert met the mountains, the winds were strong. They'd had the run of the place, after all, and now these rising shelves of rock came to thwart them. The remote recorded gusting clouds of brown-red grit, dust devils, a great complex of thermals whirling upwards and carrying all sorts of fine debris into the higher atmosphere. The camera had lost sight of the plastic bag. Now it veered back into view, far closer. The remote was rising, above the peaks now looking down. The thing, the indisputably living thing, lazily undulated its way along the line of the mountains. We think it's more than 10 meters across, Bolteel's voice broke in, because the remote gave little indication of scale. It was like a jellyfish, a thing of absurdly thin layers, radial in layout, riding the winds and trailing filaments barely visible save where they shimmered in the sunlight. Following it for a long time, Bolteel pointed out that it was not simply airborne throtsome at the mercy of the elements. Some structure within it constantly trimmed its shape and dimensions, as though a crew of sailors was taking in and letting out sails. The mood in the audience was that perhaps Bolteel was seeing what he wanted to see, but everyone was seeing a gigantic airborne Snidarian. Everyone saw the alien. Whatever they thought of Bolteel's individual conclusions, the mood of the audience was forever changed, as were they. They were the first humans to set eyes on something that had evolved on another world and owed nothing to Earth. This is nothing, Bolteel told them, and switched to the next item in his extraterrestrial playlist.
This was one of his favorites for pure artistry. The remote drifted through a night sky, and below the land seemed barren, rugged yet flat. This was more of the desert, but temperate uplands, a plateau approximately the size and by pure charms, shape, of Texas. The planet's moon was a crescent sliver in the sky. The remote's cameras did their best to amplify the light. The ground below had a curious texture to it, walled with knotted clusters like closed fists, each sitting in a span of empty space away from its neighbors. The timing was utter serendipity. The remote, under Baltiel's guidance, was still trying to work out what it was looking at when dawn crested the edge of the world and threw out its red light. As day brightened over the plateau, the fists unclenched spirally, throwing out five branching arms whose inner surfaces were dark like pools. Not the green of chlorophyll nor any other color, they seemed more like solar cells than plants, and yet surely they were drinking in the sunlight in some exchange analogous to photosynthesis. And to do what? Their world was bounded by the plateau top that they carpeted. Or perhaps this sessile form was merely the adult, and their larvae rode the winds to be captured and consumed by vast jellyfish. Perhaps, perhaps. And here, the best guesses of Baltiel or any of them were just spitting into the hurricane of the unknown. Now the remote drifted over the sea, but that was a medium it was unsuited for, and the water was almost completely opaque. There was something wallowing just below the surface though, some huge round thing like a pale shadow glimmering within the inky ocean. Unable to make out more of it, the remote coasted on. Now they saw little nodules bobbing on the waves, little meaning larger than human size, but the dark ocean was so vast that anything was dwarfed in comparison. They were translucent, veined. Baltiel thought they were immature sky jellyfish. Perhaps, perhaps. He showed them the poles too. There was no land, no ice, but instead a weird sargassum of tendrils and coils and flowers extending for hundreds of square kilometers. Everything was organized in hubs and spokes, a bizarre tessellating pattern when seen from above. The tangle seemed living but inanimate, and yet there was a constant sense of motion from beneath. By now, nobody queried the computer or tried to get round the embargo. He had them, and who can blame them? And yet he had saved the best until last. This last sequence was where the sea met the land, shielded from the baked interior by mountains that broke the moist air and shook it down for all the rain it had to offer. Here they were on the high latitudes, still hot by Earth standards, but a breath of cool air compared to the murderous tropics. The remote's eye view soared over a flat landscape of pools and creeks and mud, a salt marsh as far as its view could take it. Everywhere there was life opening petals or leaves or some other alien organs to the sun, digging down roots to drag the seaborne minerals from the salt-saturated ground, or perhaps doing something else, some alien process without an Earth equivalent. Everything was low and stunted. The biology of this world had not produced anything that could keep a tall tree standing. Everything was blackish, with iridescent hints of blue-green or rust-red. The remote drifted lower, lenses hunting movement. Something flitted past, between it and the ground. Something winged, and definitely not a jellyfish. Pale and swift, moving quite unlike a bird, a series of staccato lunges through the air. In its wake, movement began on the ground again, the narrative of prey and aerial predator impossible to resist. There were things like spiny stones rocking into motion, making slow progress as they grazed the edge of the pools. Baltiel ended his presentation there. They'd seen enough to know how much more there must be to see. Oh, perhaps one or two were harboring some sneaking disappointment brought up on a certain kind of story, because when you went to an alien world and met the aliens, the aliens were supposed to be able to greet you. Advance science as far as you like, the human mind continued to place itself at the center of the universe. If not to create intelligence, what was it all for? Where were the cities, the spaceports, even the abandoned ruins of an elder civilization? And yet this 
was all the alien life ever discovered that the human eye could make out unaided. A miracle that has broken out of bacteria analogues in the first place. A miracle that the result was something they could even recognize as life. Then Baltiel called up their mission statement, which was of course, and entirely incidentally, to destroy all this and replace it with something more like home. Sinkovy watched the reactions of the crew with interest. There was no guarantee that they would see things from Baltiel's perspective. After all, like the old films say, we came 31 light years from Earth to terraform planets and chew gum, and we're all out of gum. Actually, there was gum, or at least the means to manufacture it, but that wasn't the point. What, after all, was the type for a terraformer? They were hardy frontiers people, surely. Tough engineers come out to carve a home for themselves in the far reaches of humanity's sphere of influence, like the railroad builders of old. Except that was bunk, of course. Nobody here was eking out a desperate, dangerous living to send back pennies for their families, nor were they the colonists, destined to tough it out under an alien sky until either they or the planet surrendered to the other. When the accelerated terraforming procedures took, the terraformers themselves would be on the first ship out, leaving the planet virgin for someone else to live on. Unless they grew so in love with their handiwork that they decided to stay against all policy and orders. And speaking of that... This has given me something of a quandary, Baltiel was saying, showing his working, even though he'd already found his answer to the sum. This is an unprecedented situation. Our mission briefing doesn't cover it. A grimace more calling up of records on their mind's eye displays or the ship's screens for them to peruse. The very first terraforming expeditions did, the insolar ones, and the first ever out-system mission. Everyone was hopped up about extraterrestrial life, and they didn't find even a microbe, and they were spending a whole lot of money and resources, and so it fell by the wayside for later missions. Nobody puts it in the manual anymore. And it's not as if we can call Earth for clarification and then wait 62 years for their thoughts on the matter. The decision's ours. By which, of course, he meant mine. Senkabi considered that they could actually just go back to sleep for six decades and change and have the ship wake them when Earth had made up its mind. But that smacked of a slavish devotion to authority that he'd never espoused. He was surprised at this crusading flame in Boltiel, though, who was apparently a less orthodox character than Senkovi had taken him for. I hope you'll support me in the command decision I'm making here. We can't just go to work on this planet, Baltiel told them all. It will be a crime, a genocide of something we may never find again in the lifespan of our species. And he was preaching to the choir, mostly. What made a terraformer? Apparently, a willingness not to terraform if there was something more interesting around, as though they'd all come down with ADHD. Seeing him frown, Baltiel sent over a direct message. Do you blame them? No, and I'm broadly supportive of your decision, Sinkerby threw back, letting the but hang there unspoken. And there were a handful who would obviously rather be terraforming. They'd come out here to do a job, and though they weren't unmoved by the marvels they'd been shown, they weren't ready to just sit on their hands. I propose we change our mission. Bulls Hill told everyone. Our suite of technology here is designed to cope with a wide range of investigatory tasks, as well as the actual rewriting of planets, after all. We have a duty to study what we found here, to report on it for Earth. We won't be the last here. This planet will become the jewel of the galaxy for scientists. But we can be first, and do a good job of laying the groundwork. We can be in the history books, all of us. All of us, meaning me. That probably there would be other names in footnotes, or immortalized as geographical features. Mount Senkovi, or maybe not, sounds like an instruction to a taxidermist. And again, Baltiel had most of them, but a few more were unhappy with this turn of events now. They were, after all, experts chosen for a particular task, and this wasn't it. Senkovi counted four. Malem, Han, Lortis, Pulister. The other seven were right with Baltiel about what they should be doing. Centerby decided this was his moment and flagged up a request to speak. Baltiel gave him the side eye and asked for a little more context than that, and in return Senkovi just data dumped the entire plan on him. Let's see if he's as clever as he thinks he is. Baltiel blinked twice, 
That momentary pause was all the others saw, and then nodded briskly. Mr. Senkovi, you have the floor. Senkovi blinked too, licked dry lips, preferring to be the scorer than the scoree when points were being dished out. All eyes on him, he coughed to buy a little time, then said, It's not like they'd just leave us alone, after all. He didn't have Baltil's grandiloquence. It was all he could do not to mumble into his chest. You know what they were calling uh, the terraforming initiative when we left Earth orbit? The Forever Project. Because this is it. This is when the human race becomes immortal. You get me? We're off Earth. We're making new homes amongst the stars, whether the stars want us or not. We have godlike power. People will come here expecting to find a home. They'll be properly impressed by the jellyfish and the moving rocks and thing what. But then they'll start asking awkward questions like, which house is mine then? I mean, you know people, but we all do. Moan, moan, demand, demand. We came 30 light years and you're showing us pictures of tidal marshland. He essayed a small smile, saw a couple of people return it. Baltiel was expressionless, waiting. How the hell did he digest all of that? Did he get the ship to pass it for him? Did he hack my files and read it before the meeting? But uh, Yusuf's right, he went on, making a nervous, fidgety gesture in Baltiel's direction. We can't do the mission, not like we're supposed to. But we can do it anyway. Look. And he began bringing up his diagrams and data, which he could hide behind enough that his voice gained strength as he soldiered on. The next planet out, Tess 834G. It's mostly an ice ball, right on the very limit of the liquid water zone, but it's geologically active, and Terraforming 101 says we can precision bomb the fault lines to set it all off at once, and then it won't be an ice ball for long, and the gas we get out of that will kill off the albedo, and after that it'll be warm enough for the water to stay water. And there's a little land, just a little, and there'll be more once the ice has slimmed down to liquid. Not much more, Han pointed out. I get 2.1% of total surface area, all small island chains. She threw her own scratch calculations into the communal virtual display for everyone to look at. Leah Han was the oldest of them, Baltiel's senior by two years, and her maths was faultless at very short notice. Nobody was heckling the other guy, Sinkovi thought, but Han was at least playing the game. So the colonists live on boats, he suggested. Is that, or they go live alongside your aliens? And how's that going to go in three or four generations? You think everyone's going to be a responsible neighbour? That's a very pessimistic appraisal of the human spirit, objected someone. Senkovi chased down the name and got Spark, and an assessment record that spoke of reliable competence without brilliance. While I happen to agree with, Baltiel killed off the topic effortlessly. We don't know what the political milieu will be amongst any columnists, and people's faces showed that the old news they'd had from Earth was front and centre in most minds. Any new arrivals could be a wave of ideological maniacs come to practice their mania out of the reach of their foes on Earth. We don't know what their priorities will be, Baltiel went on. Mine is to conserve what we've discovered here and to study it. I will be taking an independent module from the Aegean to remain in orbit around 834H. I'm looking for volunteers for that team. Mr. Senkabi has my support to attempt a terraforming of TESS 834G and he'll retain the lion's share of the ship's resources to do so. He will likewise be looking for volunteers, and I can guarantee that when we do finally get word to or from Earth, it'll be his team that has a future in the terraforming business. Still not as interesting as studying flying Medusae, though, Senkovi concluded, but he couldn't say Baltiel hadn't given him a fair crack of the whip. For himself, he was already considering the technical challenges of bringing the ice world to life. In the end, he got Malem, Poolister, and Han, with Lortice defying Senkovi's assessment of him to join Team Alien. Three co-workers was, by his estimation, probably two more than he really needed. The machines would be doing the heavy lifting, after all. One question, Bright Spark piped up, just as everything had been decided. What if you find life under the ice on 834G? Senkovi shrugged. Then unless it has radio capacity and is a very quick learner, it's probably fucked, he said. Three. There might have been life. That was what he had to live with. 
actually, there might still be life. Initial probes on Damascus, Senkabi had taken the liberty of installing his pet name like a squatter and daring Boltiel to evict, had picked up complex chemistry along deep sea vents, but precious little beyond. The water column itself was barren. That chemistry was still there in places, and in fact two decades of colossally accelerated volcanism had perhaps even benefited it, spreading its habitat across the sea floor. Was it life? Results were inconclusive. Whatever was going on there seemed to be more about clay matrices than cell membranes, and relied on a toxic balance of chemicals that would be anathema to natives both of Earth and TESS 834H, which Senkabi had privately named Nord, because it was notionally east, or at least sunward, of the Eden that he himself was creating. He had downplayed the possible biochemistry aspect in his reports to Boltiel, while simultaneously knowing that the man would not be fooled. It created a convenient fiction between them that they could show to later auditors. Boltiel was sharper than Senkavi had initially thought. After his big presentation about 834G, Senkavi had asked the man, How did you get through all that fast enough to make the decision? And Boltiel had just said, I've seen your appraisals and tolerances. You wouldn't state your career on a bad bet. All I needed to see was that you were staying the hell off my planet. And he had smiled blandly, and Senkavi had learned a lot about his boss from that expression. An inclination to play God was part and parcel of wanting to go out and terraform other worlds, but good practice was to at least play nicely with the rest of the Pantheon. Senkavi had met Avrana Kern once, it had been hard to avoid her, and there was a woman who was her own Zeus, Odin and Yahweh all in one. Voltiel's role had only ever been intended as a subordinate Vulcan, but now he had found a new lease of divinity, a project Kern could not reach across the abyss to dictate. All oh, very wearying, Senkavi thought. He had been out of storage for six months this time round, because after a couple of years of targeted bombardment, the primary volcanic phase was reaching completion, and he and his people needed to set the next set of wheels in motion. Han was skimming drones over the surface of Damascus right now, mapping the new borders of the ice, which was confined to around a quarter of the surface and split between the poles. Still pretty damn cold by Earth standards, but the greenhouse gases were building nicely, and they'd installed a set of solar collectors to funnel even more heat in. The atmosphere of Damascus was fairly dense and mostly inert. The vast quantities of water had gifted the place with a little oxygen, even without anything actively metabolizing it which was a huge time-saving for Senkavi, as it allowed him to install more complex oxygenators, which needed a bit of the O2 already present to bootstrap them. He was about to turn the seas green, clogging them with the sort of algal slick that would horrify a beach full of tourists. That would set the oxygen meter creeping upwards, but of course that in itself would be robbing the planet of heat-retaining CO2, meaning the whole volcanism and greenhouse gassery would need to be kicked up a notch, and the equilibrium of the atmosphere kept balanced like a spun plate that couldn't be allowed to so much as wobble for year upon year. And then there would come some more waiting, and he'd sleep out most of it, except the current bout of watch and wait had tested his patience enough to set him on some side projects, and now they were sufficiently advanced that he was contemplating spending another year of his life on them, rather than saving it for the actual terraforming. He glanced at his companion, who had come out to stare through the glass at him. Hungry yet? he asked, but he didn't think so. Paul was just curious. Curiosity was something Senkavi had bred into him, building on his work back on Earth. Really, this had been no more than a hobby, no more out of order than Han's painting or Poulister's tedious logic puzzles, except it had turned into a sufficient sink of mission resources that Senkavi had begun to think of ways to make it work for him. Just about on time, Boltiel checked in, the signal coming at a staggered delay from the relay satellite orbiting Nord. Senkavi judged the time apt for revelation and opened a visual channel. Boltiel had been taking things slowly on Nord. They were still flying carefully disinfected drones over the planet, trying to inventory the biomes and their contents, sleeping on ice while the systems generated hypothetical taxonomies. Senkavi looked it over every month or so, impressed with the man's restraint. 
He knew that boots on the ground was the plan, in a hermetically sealed biodome. Baltiel would be the first man to walk with aliens, but only with a heavy-duty hazard suit between him and them, for everyone's protection. Hola, boss. Sengui composed his best smile. We're seeding now. Algol Spring comes to Damascus. I saw. Because obviously Baltiel returned the courtesy and checked Senkovi's working on a regular basis. You're ahead of schedule, even. You're behind, Senkovi couldn't stop himself saying. To his surprise, Baltiel grimaced. I... And of course, some of the given reasons for the man dragging his feet had been that he wanted Senkovi's operation established and stable, so that the crew remaining on the Aegean could charge over to mount a rescue if something went wrong, or vice versa. Senkovi had already dismantled that logic and decided there were deeper and more personal bonds holding Baltiel back. The man's face now confirmed it. You want to make a good first impression, Senkovi completed, and you only get the one chance. That's it. A gentler smile than any expression the Senkovi had seen on Baltiel's face before. We're going down there. It's all planned. But I check and check again. I've had samples in the lab up here exposed to every microbe in the human body, to every earth molecule. And vice versa, I hope. It should be safe, Baltiel said, surely for his own benefit as much as anyone's. There's some negative interaction at the molecular level, and there's more arsenic down there than we'd normally like. But biological interaction? None. They don't have our DNA, our cell chemistry, any of it. Nothing's going to get killed by the common cold. Nobody's going to catch the Martian flu, and we'll still be suited up, sealed away. He sounded like someone looking for a second opinion, so Senkovi nodded amiably. I've given your proposal the once over. I don't see any gaps. He might have said more, but Paul chose that point to detach from the corner of his tank and come forward to goggle out at the screen. What the hell is that? Paul Teal demanded. Yusuf, meet Paul. Say hello, Paul. Understandably, Paul said nothing. What is it? Senkovi frowned. He's a Pacific striped octopus. He sent over a data dump of files on cephalopods of all kinds, in case Baltiel was criminally underinformed on the subject. But you must be way off seeding complex life. Baltiel's brief eye twitch showed him searching through the mission plan. Well, yes, but. Duzra, is this a pet? Have you been using mission resources to breed domestic octopodes? Another brief twitch, and Senkabi knew his superior had been looking up the plural and settled on the most awkward sounding one. Time for the long con. It's like this. We have an unprecedented level of underwater work on this project. Because, obviously, the planet is almost all underwater. Now, while we have drones and remotes and the like, it won't be enough if we want to keep to schedule. So you won't be ahead of schedule for long. Tenkami decided he could throw his past self under the bus for the benefit of his future self. Sure, I was optimistic. However, I've got a solution. Paul can help. Baltiel raised an eyebrow, a reaction sent over minutes between planets that Tenkami felt it was worth waiting for. Do you know the work Khalifi and Roos were doing for Dr. Kern? Baltiel's eyebrow ratcheted up further, because right now everyone knew about that work. Certainly everyone back on Earth had an opinion about it 31 years ago, and the most recently received opinions were extremely vocal. It had been a cause celebre for the reactionaries, a justification for terrorism, bombed out labs and brutalized monkeys. The viral work, he said flatly. It wasn't finished when we set out, not quite, but I have a lot of their research. I was even co-author for one of the papers. Senkovi was not looking Baltiel in the eye now, his attention shifting to Paul instead. I mean, I'm not talking actual uplift, not like they did it, but a little tweaking, a little acceleration. Not to mention improving lifespan and post-egg laying survival, but I'm not saying that because you'd want to know why. So that when the sea is sufficiently habitable, we can have a workforce to help us. Baltiel said nothing for a long time, enough that Senkabi checked twice to ensure the link was still open. What's he going to do? He's on a different planet. He has his own obsessions. Is he calling Han to tell her to replace me? 
So, I bred a better octopus. Is that so wrong? Submit a proper plan, at least, before you start meddling with them. The words jolted Senkovi into eye contact again, and for a moment the two of them just stared at each other across the thousands of kilometers. We are both off our briefs, Senkovi realized. We're rebel angels, and by the time God, meaning Avrona Kern, realizes what we're up to, it'll be too late. I will, he promised, glidely sidestepping the fact that he'd already started. From his tank, Hall watched him with one slit-pupiled eye, tentacles curling in elaborate arabesques. Four. Terraforming gave them all time to think. Yes, they were hurrying the planet's changes along at a ludicrous rate compared to geological time, from ice ball to ocean within a small slice of a human lifetime. Still, humans had a goal to live with days and months and seasons. The waiting was hard. Nobody wanted to just fall back into cold sleep the moment the opportunity arose, telling the Aegean to wake them in a decade. They wanted to see the world below them start to germinate before they closed their eyes. And so they practiced art, music, read the ship's stored library front to back, played procedurally generated strategy games advertised never to repeat themselves, and almost everyone became obsessive now and then. The Earthlink was what got most of them. Pulister, Han, Malam, they had all spent time trying to discuss what was happening back home. People were fighting. There were localised war zones, mostly the traditional sort where the big players' soldiers got to go play in the backyards of their neighbours to minimise the property damage of friendly allies. Proxy wars, and keeping it clean so far, but everyone knew that there were stocks of chemical and biological agents just sitting around waiting for someone to lose patience with polite and limited wars. And the news was old, of course, over three decades. They were out here on the edge of humanity's sphere of influence, their ability to communicate with home crippled by the insuperable laws of relativity. Senkovi had heard Pulister and Malam in full-blown argument, one of those pointless rows where both of them were effectively arguing the same case, where the argument itself was the point, not the winning of it. He hadn't realised before then just how riled up everyone was about Earth and the growing conflict they were hearing about a generation late. And probably it was all settled now, peace and harmony, but that old demon relativity brought an end to any difference in acceleration between good news and bad, truth and rumour. None of it could get to them faster than the light of their home world's distant sun, leaving them to endlessly speculate about how bad things might have got. Senkovi himself kept out of the discussion and kept out of their way. He was already obsessive, a trait he had proudly smuggled onto the Aegean long before it had become de rigueur, and he was using the waiting time to indulge in his own personal schemes. When Han came to see him, this was months after his brittle détente with Boltiel over Paul, her first comment was, You're supposed to be in the freezer by now. Don't wanna, Senkovi told her sticking out his bottom lip because he'd learned that with some people, a veneer of feigned childishness could transform his peculiarities from obnoxiously antisocial to charming. Busy. Busy keeping us out of here, she noted. This was Payload Bay 7, wasn't it? Only none of this looks like Payload, Dizra. It is Payload, of a sort. He was already being defensive, and he'd hoped to keep that in reserve when charmingly childish wore thin. I filed a plan with Bolt's Hill. He's all over this like a rash, believe me. Dizra, I saw the plan you filed. It was thin. And you must have pushed past its parameters an age ago. Preliminary testing, it said. And it went very well, so I made an executive decision. Bolt Hill will back me. Han was a tall, slender woman who looked as though she should be an aesthete, all impromptu haiku and abstract paintings. In fact, her paintings were all of robots, fantastical, impractical metal humanoids lit by industrial fires or explosions, as though she had a window onto a world where cybernetics had gone in very different directions. On top of that, perhaps despite that, she was the best engineer on the terraforming team, a genius mathematician and a pilot. And all of that, Senkovi had thought, should have been enough to keep her busy and not send her snooping around here. He felt like a boy caught doing something untoward after lights out, 
sitting on the floor of Bay 7 with a half-gutted virtual console, lit by the azure radiance of the big tank he'd had constructed. Han put a hand to the transparent plastic, seeing the occupants detach from the fake coral and rocks he'd given them, drifting towards her fingers to see if they would give any entertainment value. I'm guessing you're not sending them planetside anytime soon, she noted. Unless you've engineered the fuck out of them to not need oxygen or Earth-style temperatures or pH. As it happens, they aren't ready for deployment, no. Zenkabi told her shortly, wishing she'd just go away, and if possible forget everything she was currently looking at. I'm still very much in the R&D phase of the project, as you must know if you've read... Why squid? Not squid. Octopi. Octopuses if you want to be a slave to the dictionary. And why not? What's wrong with them? Han glanced down at him. You've got a genetic library that's a good slice of Earth biodiversity, Dizra. You've got the kit here to hatch out anything, unextinct it. Pulister was talking about making a dog. Dizra, not much of a dog person, shrugged. Why not? I mean, what would you do? Let me guess, you had a cat back home? Fish? He decided Han probably had owned a cat, or had wanted to own a cat but hadn't lived somewhere she could get a pet permit. Maybe she'd had a robot cat, one of those good little machines that purred and sat on your lap and then its ears fell off the moment its warranty expired. I'd make a tiger, Han said. Senkavi was speechless for a long time, enough that his console began lighting up with frustrated red error messages as his fellow game player got annoyed with his inaction. Ha! He managed eventually. Han grinned down at him. It was the first time he had ever seen her smile, perhaps. He suddenly found his opinion of her completely revised. She wanted to recreate a tiger, here on the Aegean, where the narrow corridors and enclosed workspaces would lead to an interesting work-life balance for the humans having to share the ship with a large carnivore. And of course she'd never go ahead and actually do it. Zenkabi was frankly the only person on the ship who would just live the dream and to hell with the opinions or even permissions of others. But the thought was there, and Senkavi decided he liked Han a lot better for it. I had a tiger when I was a kid, she said candidly, and he wondered if that meant a stock toy, or if she came from an income bracket considerably above even his own rather privileged one. But you, you've got a whole load of these, Optipi, and no tigers. Ah, well, the key failing with tigers is that their performance drops off sharply when you get them to mend coolant pipes a kilometre below the surface of the ocean. Han stared at him for long enough to make him uncomfortable, then the grin was back. That's not what this is about, she pointed out. Senkabi thought about keeping up the pretense, but decided she was too sharp for it. Oh, well it is, I mean, that's the end goal. But I had an octopus when I was a kid. Rather more than one, but the narrative was simpler that way. Then his console beeped sharply at him and he hurriedly made a move to keep it quiet. Too late, though, for Han was crouching down beside him. Who are you playing against? Is that Paulista? He can't play with a dam. The console was displaying a tile-laying game, a little idealized landscape half-constructed from squares, linking roads, rivers, cities. And it was a mess. Pieces all over, roads spiraling to nowhere, the spiky walls of towns clustering like sea urchins. It's... not Paulista, no. Han's eyes were following where the cables from the console led, and yes, he could have just run the whole thing in virtual space on the Aegean system, and that was the logical next step. Right now, he was trying to keep his games private, because the others would mock. Han wasn't mocking though. He could see the wheels of her mind turning. You're... Paul, Tengabi explained. Well, Paul 5. He's the most successfully modified. He likes the console and experiencing virtual space and I thought, well, there are humans who never really take to a virtuality, but the octopi are all about manipulating space. There's no tactile element for them yet, and I thought that would be the sticking point, but they get it very quickly, Paul Vive especially. So I'm trying some simple games, with debatable success. He makes moves and he's understood the limits the game places on when he can move and what moves can be made, but as far as strategy or points or winning, that seems to be outside his range at the moment. 
Tell him he doesn't get fed if he loses, Han suggested, staring into the tank. Senkabi had tried that. Pavlovian motivation wasn't terribly useful for training an octopus. Once they were fed, food became a lesser motivator than curiosity. Also, when Senkabi had contrived to communicate that the game hid a shrimp inside it somehow, Paul too had broken the game trying to take it apart. We're going to need this space back for payload sooner rather than later, Han remarked eventually, even somewhat regretfully. Firstly, this is payload, albeit highly experimental. Secondly, we don't. No, I've reorganized. We can get by on the other bays. I've even gained us some space. He sent over his changes, which were in fact just as advertised, to the virtual space their mind's eyes shared. The designers of the Aegean had been slacking somewhat, leaning on their large budget. Senkabi had improved on their work to provide the ship with improved economy of space and movement of materiel, the sort of thing that someone might have achieved genuine commendations for. The entire elaborate operation looked good on paper to anyone who didn't suspect he'd gone through it solely because he wanted more space for fish tanks. After Han had gone, he finished the game and fed his pets, hoping that the rest of the ship wasn't already tittering behind his back about crazy Senkovi and his performing mollusks. The console was already flashing though, despite Paul being busy dismantling a crab. It was one of the others, Salome. She had been watching Paul and now she had used her own newly implanted connection to break into the game system. She had moved as much as she could, but now needed him to take his own turn before she could continue playing. Senkabi suspected he should probably get away from the tanks and go have human contact or something healthy like that. On the other hand, he just had an actual conversation, which was quite wearying, and he could hardly disappoint such a keen experimental subject. He sat down again dropping a tile into the virtual space and waiting to see what Salome would do. Five. Siri Sky would be in charge of the orbiting module in Baltiel's absence. She and four others would have relatively little to do except continue to round off the rough edges of the database the computer was assembling on the Nord biosphere, Senkovi's joke name having gradually infiltrated the collective consciousness. Of course, technically, Boltiel himself should be staying up top and delegating the ground party, but he was damned if he was going to. This was the day he had been waiting for, in and out of sleep over the years since their arrival here. He would not only be on the shuttle down, he would be the first damned human being to set foot on this world. Nobody was taking that from him. Remotes had been down there for a long time now, setting things up. There was a habitat ready to receive them, filled with an atmosphere not vastly different to that outside, a little lower pressure, a little more oxygen. An earthish atmosphere, though, and the gravity would be real, even if a little stronger than they were used to. He had been living in space, sometimes in rotational gravity, sometimes in none, for too long. Of course, the plan was purely to run a research mission, the research mission he had invented to replace what they were actually supposed to be up to, out on Nord. He shouldn't be thinking about the place as home. It would be a pokey little series of interconnected domes, barely more personal space than on the module they'd separated from the Aegean and left in orbit when the rest of the ship went off on the road to Damascus. Senkabi and his damn fool names. But they always seemed to stick. No doubt the colonists would have their own sanitized monikers for both planets when they arrived. Or maybe not. That depended on just how badly things actually went back home. Senkabi said they'd get boatloads of desperate refugees turning up at every terraforming station, clamoring to be housed and fed. The great human diaspora, but not how anyone had envisaged it. Baltiel had sat down to a meal with all his crew, not long ago. He'd tweaked the rotors especially so that everyone would be awake and ready for the historic launch. The mood had been cautiously optimistic. Earth was very far away after all, and everyone was sure that things there would sort themselves out. The mysteries of Nord were far more immediate for them. Sky had even wondered about harvesting something edible from the planet, because Senkovi was a long way from commercial fisheries over on Damascus. Sky was a geologist, though, and tended not to read the monograms of other specialities. 90% of Nord proteins were indigestible to humans, not immediately poisonous, but just inert stuff that would clog up your gut and probably kill you eventually, from the levels of arsenic and mercury the planet seemed to thrive on. 
The remaining 10% were not economical to separate out. Baltiel had expected to be the great expert on the land of Nord by now. Instead, he felt as though their accumulated knowledge of the planet was to the mind what the alien flesh would be to the stomach. Almost impossible to assimilate. It wasn't that the automated survey had turned up blank, quite the opposite. They had a vast wealth of information about the planet, and no way to readily put it together in any kind of order. He felt like a school kid taught history as a list of dates and names of kings, without context to let him draw meaning from the information. Norden organisms were organized into cells, just like Earth creatures, although the cells themselves were very different. They were smaller for one thing, no bigger than an E. coli bacterium on average. There was no nutrius, but some manner of transmissible organization, incredibly dense, was implanted in the membrane. Lante, wearing her biochemist hat, was talking about atomic level information storage, more compact than DNA, but perhaps more energy intensive to produce. Every cell seemed to react to light, even the ones buried deep in the bodies of creatures. Why? Nobody had a good theory. Plenty of the organisms they had looked at appeared to be metabolizing sunlight, some sessile-like plants, others highly mobile, suggesting that their mechanism, as yet unknown but there were some fascinating suggestions, was far more efficient than plant photosynthesis, and there appeared to be no hard plant-slash-animal divide on Nord. Almost every organism was radially symmetrical, top and bottom, but no front or back save where evolution had twisted them round to let them flap through the sky's dorsal side first. Oh, and many of them were only partially cellular, with large portions of their bodies composed of a plasticky tissue that seemed almost inanimate and which was manipulated and deformed by contracting fibers. The jellyfish, which comprised a significant phylum of northern life, were all sail and hardly any actual ship. Baltiel wasn't someone whose mind leapt instantly to thoughts of commercial exploitation, but Nord had already shown him forms of information storage, energy conversion, and super-strong, super-light materials that Earth technology could not currently replicate. And yet at the same time, the Norden ecosystem felt young. Aside from some truly colossal medusae forms, nothing on land seemed bigger than a medium-sized dog. There was nothing like a forest, nothing like wood, nothing much like an internal skeleton. Everything sprawled outwards rather than fighting for height. He wondered if this was what Earth would have felt like back in the Devonian era, or some such, when life was just encroaching on land. What might they become? But he would never know, and he had a bitter certainty that human presence in this solar system meant that nobody would, that the future of life on Nord was going to be brutally curtailed. He had not sent anything home about their discoveries. As far as he knew, everyone had respected his orders on that front. But it wouldn't matter as soon as the next wave of Earthlings arrived, ready to wash away all these fragile knocks in the sand prior to building some prime beachfront property on any habitable planet they found. He had daydreamed about putting plague beacons in orbit all over the planet, warning off the future. So instead, he was indulging himself he and his crew would do what they could to curate this riot of weirdly unambitious seeming life while they were still able to. There would be a record for later generations, even if there would be nothing else. He sent a call to Sky over the module's network, and she confirmed her readiness, highlighting the green system readouts. He checked to ensure that his ground team had reached the shuttle. Irma Lante, biologist and medic, and Gav Lortis, geothermal engineer and general technician, were there, and Calvin Rani, meteorologist and pilot, was just on her way. She had a message pending, and he checked it anxiously, expecting something to have arisen to delay his destiny, faults, storms, something. Instead, she was recommending he speak to Senkovi. He had some meteorological data for me to analyze, but when it came through it was nonsense. He may be having problems. Baltiel felt he had plenty of his own problems, to which he really didn't want to add Senkovi. The man was supposed to be so damn self-sufficient after all. He set his feet on the brief path to the shuttle bay, and a sudden rush of excitement seized him, like a child about to go on a much dreamt of holiday. He'd been living in this tin can for too long, subjectively for years, objectively, meaning by the ship's clock, for decades. Like a child again, but one who'd been staring at the presence under the tree for a generation, 
not forbidden to open them, but exercising inhuman self-restraint. Like a child, nobody on his team would describe him so. He was the man who was always calm, who always had an answer, who could even, miracle of miracles, talk Senkovi up or down or sideways from wherever the man's thought processes had led him. And yet, inside, Altiel felt a bubbling, innocent glee. The timing of the mission, however well accounted for in the records, was more to do with him having finally exhausted his iron reserves of patience. Today was Christmas, and he was about to tear off the wrapping paper. Still, he was overall command, and Senkabi's little fiefdom was still part of overall, at least nominally, so he had the module signal its other self, the Aegean. Hi, boss came the delayed response, by which time Boltiel was in the shuttle double-checking Lortis and Rani as they double-checked each other's pre-flight checks, belt and braces all the way down. Suri's chasing up some met data from you, Boltiel prodded. Oh, um, yes. No, not a priority right now. By which time everyone on the ground crew had checked everyone else's sums, and Siri Sky had confirmed their launch window, and the excited child taking up space in Voltiel's head was virtually blocking out everything else. And Senkabi sounded off balance, which should have been a huge worry given how the man kept his insides inside, but surely it couldn't be now that things went catastrophically wrong. Not on the very edge of departure. And yet. Desra, what's up? We're just having a few system glitches, boss. Nothing to worry about. Senkovi's tone, when it finally came back, was transparent. He's screwed up somehow and he doesn't want me to check up. And Boltiel could check up, of course. He could query the Aegean with his command access, and then doubtless cut through all the baffles and screens Senkovi had festooned the problem data with. Or he could just let Senkovi get on with it and deny the man the chance to rain on Boltiel's greatest ever parade. He made a command decision that even then he knew was on the wrong side of cautious. He'd been cautious for twenty years though, time for one glorious, reckless act. Cutting the connection, he decided to let Senkabi scoop his own crap without supervision, this one time, and hoped that the man didn't end up finger-painting it all over the walls. He refused to lose the launch window. He couldn't know, at the time, just what was riding on the decision. Sky. When you are... Sky and the rest of the module crew were already settled in to continue the data gathering. Most of them would be back in cold sleep as soon as the shuttle was safely down. He was surprised there hadn't been more jostling for a place on the ground, but going to live with the jellyfish didn't appeal to everyone. The shuttle bay was evacuated around them, the air jealously grabbed back before it could be wasted. The bay doors opened, the clamps released, and the rotation of the module gently released the shuttle out into space, along a perfectly plotted pitch. Boltiel had chosen the salt marsh biome for his base because it was more hospitable than the searing inland deserts. Not that their suits didn't have temperature control, but the less the technology had to work, the longer it would last without maintenance. Of the land biomes, it seemed the most populous too, where an anthropocentric eye could perhaps see evolution striving to produce something more. And that was an illusion, surely, Probably the great fonts of evolutionary activity were elsewhere, and left to their own devices there would have been some great new wave of development from the deep sea, or the floating creatures of the upper atmosphere. But moot now, we can only observe the present before we go on to destroy the future. The thought made Boltiel so angry, but unless the commander of the next ship along was also a radical conservationist, how could any of this life have long-term prospects? Oh, surely individual species would survive alongside humans, or be relegated to reserves and zoos, but the ecological history of Earth showed how pitiful such measures were. One of the terraforming program's great triumphs was being able to reconstruct whole Earth ecosystems, systems that didn't exist as anything other than deathbed wounded back on their original planet. Because in a very real way, the ecosystem was the basic unit of life, species creating, by their very presence, an environment for other species to work in. We wrecked it all back home, Boltiel thought, and by the time we understand Nod, we'll have wrecked it here as well. For a moment, he'd had a mad dream of an earth mimic Damascus and an alien Nod side by side, coexisting. 
The spiraling bad news from home had ground down that dream into a kind of bleak nihilism. We will learn what we can and record it. I will be able to say, I walked there. They can't take that from me, no matter who comes. Even the thought of Earth, the political rants, the casualty figures, the spiraling insanity, made his gut clench. But he consciously banished the images and medicated the gut reaction, just like they were all doing these days. I will not let a little global war ruin my moment, and it's all history anyway, by the time it reaches us. The shuttle was falling into its pre-planned descent, Rani keeping a close eye in case she needed to intervene. Lortis had a presence in the shuttle performance system, but it was more out of habit than genuine worry. Lante appeared to be dozing, even as they came into contact with the upper atmosphere. Baltiel himself was staring at the images, views of Nod from the module, from the shuttle, a world of brown, black, and red, far from the green-blue jewel of a terraformed new Earth. A transmission came in from the Aegean, and he looked at it despite everything. What now? But it was gibberish, just strings of alphanumeric characters chopped up to look like language but devoid of meaning. A practical joke? Because that was something on Senkovi's file, one of his ways of impressing on lesser people just how clever he was although this didn't seem up to his usual standard. He sent a query back. They were going for a shallow descent to save wear and tear on the shuttle as much as possible, but also so Baltiel could use the ventral cameras to get a new fly-by view of his domain. Below them was the obsidian expanse of the ocean, the wine-dark sea. Too high right now to see anything more, but they would get a good skim over the waves before they crossed past the coast. Hey boss, no, all fine. 8 J S G J G R J G 81 UFWYTMV slash I9RF. All under control here, all fine. How's the flight? KKSN HU9 D I99 T K. Dizra, what the hell? Abruptly, there was a very uneasy feeling in the pit of Baltiel's stomach because he was getting a lot of ghosting nonsense from the Aegean around sync of his signal, multiple separate transmissions from the ship that manifested as sudden intrusions of nonsense audio shutting out the man's voice channel. It's, uh, look, boss, don't panic, I'm gonna have to turn it off and on again. I made the wrong call. He was in the Nord Orbital's only shuttle and it was committed to the approach now. There was no way he could go and help Senkovi. Although even if we were still sitting back up there in orbit, it'd take the best part of a year with the positions the planets are in right now. Explain, he demanded curtly. I'm having some system infiltration issues, came Senkovi's voice, trying and failing to be casual about it. I, HHS, I4, GK, semicolon, GG, 8, LUB, J2. I need to restart the ship's systems from scratch, boss. I'm really sorry. It's a bit N83, full stop, LJSG, full stop, N, H, G, I, K, 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 D. Screwed up. Baltiel's insides were screwing themselves up, partly in worry, partly furious that somehow Senkovi had managed to piss on his moment of glory. Explain, he repeated, and then looking at an initial analysis of the nonsense transmissions. Are you being hacked? No, no, no. Yes. Senkovi's delayed response sounded as though it was somehow funny, whilst simultaneously being horribly serious. Look, I'm sending the others off on the shuttle. Just in case things... 9WKS, RJ, I-934, MMG, PPPP, HHHH, AO. Hello, hello, what, what? Uh, just in case things go really badly, which they won't, but it's all a bit... What, what, 95 MG, semicolon, who, query, query. You know, kind of, I've said that if things go really badly, they should skip over to Nod and throw themselves on your mercy. Not their fault, all mine, okay? Dizra, just tell me what the hell? Baltiel had already shouted over the man's babble. The increasingly organized nature of the other signals was prickling the hairs on his neck. Has he kickstarted the ship into full AI or something? Victim of my own success, came Senkovi into a sudden silence as the other transmissions cut off. I've clamped down on bandwidth, but I can't keep them bottled up. I'm taking it all offline. All you need to know, normal service will resume shortly. 
That is not all I need to know. Baltiel was trying to interrogate the Aegean, but between Senkavi trying to cover himself and whatever chaos was actually going on over there, he wasn't getting a coherent picture. On the screens in front of him, the Nodden seascape was lost in the shuttle's rushing progress, and now there was red desert below. According to his diagnostics, there were half a dozen net presences in the Aegean system. Weird, undirected processes lurching around trying to access ship systems. He thought his demand must have come too late, but Senkabi obviously caught it before flipping the switch. All right, boss. Here's the lowdown, came the reply. I may have failed to contain my experimental subject properly. Explain. I've been training them up, teaching them basic communications so they could interact with the equipment on Damascus. They'll be useful. We'll need them. Only they're curious, right? Is inbuilt with them. And I've been using the Rus Khalif B viral catalyst to select for that. Only I didn't realize how quickly they'd catch on. In the midst of all the man's justifications, Baltiel suddenly understood what Senkovi meant. Dizra, are you talking about your damned octopodes? Boss, I am. He sounded partly embarrassed, but also impressed with himself too, or at least with his pets. I taught them to access the system, play games, basic teaching stuff, and now they're past my security and just, you know, poking around. Curious, like I said, and I can't stop them, and they're screwing everything up. It's all innocent, but I made a bit of a monster, boss. No, I'm suited up, and everyone else is getting the fuck out on the shuttle. I'll fix this. Why aren't you on the shuttle, Dizra? Boss, it's my bad. I can sort it better from in here. There's always something you have to go do by hand. Use a remote. Dizra, do you hear me? Baltiel's own shuttle was beginning its landing approach now. They were over the black and grey mottling of the salt marsh, and a flash of white in the distance was the habitat. I'm suited up. I have independent power. All set, boss. Gotta go. Senkabi's voice cracked at the end, and Baltiel suddenly understood. His pets. Shutting the ship down was a death sentence for his precious octopodes, and he wanted to be there for them or maybe even save some of them. And probably he'd get killed, and Han and the rest would have to finish the terraforming without either Senkobi's brilliance or his goddamn mollusks. With that, Baltiel forced himself to let go. Senkovi had finally found a way to get out from overall command, and now neither Baltiel nor any other human agency could help him. It isn't my problem, he decided. Not for want of trying, but he's gonna have to get out of it himself. He imagined the Aegean as if the ship was literally crawling with Senkovi's rebellious progeny, monstrous cephalopods blobbering through the compartments waving angry tentacles. Of course, they would be in tanks somewhere, their intrusion purely virtual and yet irresistible, circumventing everything Senkovi could throw up to keep them out. But then when you're designing an interface to let mollusks play computer games, you probably don't build in that much security. Baltiel had a moment to consider how that was a sequence of words he'd never expected to be relevant in his life. And then they were landing. Rani hovering over the controls like a hawk in case the shuttle's onboard got it wrong. And Baltiel already had a hand up to release his straps because, goddammit, he was going to be first on the ground. Amazing. How quiet. Almost worth it just for this. But Senkovi didn't really believe that. He couldn't know about Baltiel's inner child thoughts, but he himself was making a very similar comparison. Only for him, his inner child had done a very bad thing indeed, and unlike all the other times, hadn't been able to cover the evidence before being found out. Baltiel's gonna have my hide as soon as he's done playing Lewis and Clark. Also like a child, some part of him was desperately casting about as some superior authority to blame. Someone should have told me not to except that he had worked very hard to abstract himself from any kind of oversight, even the distant watch that Baltiel could have kept over him. Senkovi had been absolutely convinced of the rightness of his own actions, and it had all been wholly amusing until it had become utterly fucked up. It struck him, in a moment of wry self-reflection, that he was the whole terraforming program in miniature, Kern and Baltiel and all of them. We get them to throw money and resources at us so we can go and be gods somewhere else. Because when you were 30 light years from Earth, who was going to tell you to stop? 
and now he was standing in a vast, silent tomb of a ship, wearing a cumbersome spacesuit, and knowing he had a remarkably long time before the computer system cleansed itself and bootstrapped itself back into being. Han, Poolister, and Malum were kicking back in the shuttle, anxiously waiting to hear from him. If he had been playing it by the book, insofar as his particular book existed, he should have been with them, doing everything remotely. By hand was better though, especially as Salome had somehow accessed the remote channels and begun to use the machines as bonus limbs in her spirited attempts to dismantle the Aegean to find out what it was and whether she could eat it. Paul had always been Sankovi's favourite student, meaning he had entirely missed how destructively smart Salome was. And that was not to mention Saul, Ruth, Methuselah, renamed from Peter after he got to ten years without showing signs of ageing, Jezebel, and, well, Sankovi had worked quite hard to ensure that casual scrutiny from a distracted Bolteel did not pick up that he now had 43 octopi on the staff register, all of them of biblical nomenclature because of the original Paul, and because once he had Damascus and Nord past the censors, he might as well stick with a the theme. And because it would have annoyed some of the irritating fundamentalists back home had they ever heard about it, and Senkabi loved nothing more than amusing himself. Forty-three octopodes, as Baltiel would say, but Senkabi preferred the feel of the even more incorrect octopi on the tongue, and he was used to pleasing himself first and foremost. And now he was learning just precisely why he had been considered a good second, but only when careful Baltiel was there to hold his leash because he had royally screwed up. He had known from long before from his pets back home that octopi responded very badly to rigid Pavlovian training. They weren't like rats or pigeons or dogs who would do the same thing over and over until they had more food than they could eat. Instead, they were curious in a way even dogs weren't, because evolution had gifted them with a profoundly complex toolkit for taking the world apart to see if there was a crab hiding under it as I am bloody well now having cause to regret. Senkabi had charged up every portable battery he could find, and now had a trolley of devices to get to the centre of the Aegean. The centre was where the gravity wasn't, of course, and he had set up his labs there because the octopi got used to not caring much about up and down quickly enough. The Pacific striped octopus had always been his preferred test subject, just as it was his preferred pet. Unlike most of their relatives, they were passably social and long-lived, the two major deficiencies that in Senkovi's opinion octopus kind had been cursed with. They were intellectually agile too, but that was true across the octopus board. Senkovi's personal theory was that the pressure of being in the middle of the food chain was an essential prerequisite for complex intelligence. Like humans, and like poor tiered spiders, had he only known, Octopuses had developed in a world where they were both hunter and hunted. Top predators, in Senkovi's assessment, were an intellectual dead end. He had bred several generations, each one further mediated by limited intervention by the Rus Khalifi virus. That had been hard, but mostly because he had needed to be ruthless, and Senkovi was soft at heart, especially when it came to the objects of his obsession. The later generations had been markedly better at interacting with abstract devices and operating machinery, and then his lax experimental procedures had borne unexpected fruit. Most of the previous generation had still been around and in contact with his new enfant terrible, and they had started picking up the same behaviours, less directed but still determinedly exploring the virtual space he gave them access to. The major challenge had been developing cephalopod-friendly interface devices, and Senkovi was aware that his own imagination had been the primary constraint with that. The creatures that were a boneless, infinitely mutable hand, with independently sensing and thinking fingers, his pitiful controls were wasting most of their potential. One day they'll design their own. But that was taking things too far, or rather, it was stable door after bolting horse, because things had already gone too far. One of his pets had almost opened one of the airlocks before he had jumped in to stop it. Paul had been fighting him for control of the communications suite. Salome had flown wobbling drones through the compartments of the Aegean, opening and closing doors and attacking walls with the cutting torches. All just harmless fun, he assured himself, and yet they had reacted swiftly to his attempts to cut them off. 
He closed one virtual opening and they squeezed through another, multitasking in a way that he and eventually the entire human crew couldn't match. In order for them to do the jobs he would need them for, he had been trying to get them to understand the idea of a virtual environment. Somewhere that would be workspace, communication suite and interface, if they could only perceive it as they did the physical space around them. He had watched generations simply fail, reacting to night and touch and changes of temperature, but stubbornly refusing to make the leap to that abstract level. And then, without him doing anything in particular, without any obvious prompt or warning, Salome was in the system, and the rest all followed, tank after tank of them teaching each other somehow. Abruptly, they could all do the virtual exercises, but they weren't content with that. They expanded their virtual presence as they would their physical one, reaching out to see where the space went. And there they encountered the ship's systems. And the ship's systems, of course, connected to the rest of the ship, the air-filled bit that he and the other humans lived in. He hadn't considered that the bulk of the Aegean would be just a further extension of their online playground. Senkubi and the others had worked for hours at damage control, finding that the invertebrate test subjects had grasped certain principles of the computer system with sufficient force that they could not be pried loose. A running battle between mammal and mollusk had raged, but the Aegean was a vast and complex beast, and there were no convenient bottlenecks to stave off the invaders from inner space. The octopi had the same untethered access as the human crew, and they were playfully pulling everything apart. He lowered his crate of toys towards the ship's centerline until it was just drifting, and then he followed after it. The readouts from his HUD told him that the temperature here was dropping, but he had evacuated the space around the tanks so that their heat would take longer to diffuse outwards. This, of course, was the main reason he had stayed behind, out of contact with the human race. He was going to try and save his pets, and he didn't want Han and the others to laugh at him to recast him from eccentric to pathetic. But just like the dog lover who goes back into the burning building to save little thruffums, he was going to try and keep some of his experimental subjects alive until the ship came back online. Baltiel will want them all dead, he knew. But he could handle Baltiel. He would go against Baltiel if he had to, a full-on war in heaven of angry messages cast across the void. The nearest tank had shuttered, as had the next two. The Delizans had, like Senkovi, been too clever for their own good and found some physical egress, and now he'd killed them by evacuating the chamber. He hardened his heart and pushed on until he found one that was intact. His soup lamps shone in, and he saw motion inside, not fleeing the light but approaching it, because the octopi had learned to associate light with entertainment, and the sudden dark and quiet must be profoundly disconcerting for them. Hi, Salome. His voice was loud in his own ears. An alien eye stared at him from within the tank. The skin around it ruffled into angry spikes, awash with red and black pigment, as Salome told him precisely what she felt about being denied net access. Senkovi manhandled the heating unit out of the crate and attached it to the tank side. With luck, it would keep the water viable until the system was back up. Then he went to the water pump and fumblingly installed a battery unit to keep circulation going, independent of the ship's own mechanisms. Again, it was a stopgap measure. He went on to the next tank. He wished he could talk to Han, but he'd cut himself off entirely from their shuttle. He hadn't wanted to be bothered by their constant inquiries after his safety. He was Dizra Senkovi, the man who was an island. Right now, he felt his shores eroding. He wanted them to ask, so that he could be aloof and not answer. Floating in the dark in the bowels of a dead ship, surrounded by the living and the dead of his mollusk pets, it was a terrible time for self-knowledge to kick in. There was nobody but the octopi, though, and he felt they were judging him. He was their higher power, after all, who should have ensured they didn't steal so much fire from heaven that they ended up burning everything to the ground. He went from tank to tank, restoring warmth and circulation wherever he found live contents. At least a third were already non-viable, either because of the fatal ingenuity of the occupants or because he was too slow. He had thought of the ship as a tomb before, and now it was. And still the ship was restoring its system, 
the naive curiosity of the octopi purged from it, and he had hours yet before he could even get a progress report. His own suit was still toasty, but eventually the ship's warmth would start to leach away, and he would learn if he had enough batteries to overcome his own hubris. He settled down beside Paul's tank, anchored himself there, and turned off his lamps to conserve power. Baltiel waited for the alienness to strike him, stepping from the shuttle's airlock onto the surface of Nod. They could have jockeyed down close enough for the automatics to line up a tunnel between ship and habitat, and Baltiel had nixed the idea because of the slim chance that a slip might have damaged one or the other. In truth, though, he had wanted this. The first foot put down onto another living world, the feel of the atmosphere clenching about him, the gravity, the colour of the sunlight. And he stood there at the foot of the ramp, and there was nothing, almost nothing. So, it wasn't Earth, neither had the artificial gravity of the Aegean been, or the orbiting module which had never quite matched its parent ship for no reason they could ever find. The orange-red of the sun was compensated for by the visor display of his helmet. He could look across the flat expanse of the Great Salt Marsh, all its rivulets and pools and rocky ridges, out to the great darkness of the sea, and he might just be at a somewhat unattractive beach back home. The suit was insulating him from everything, not just a potentially hazardous atmosphere and the radiation of an alien star, but the smells, the sounds, the unalloyed sights that would make it all real. It might just be an underwhelming simulation. But we're here. And perhaps it will come yet, waking to a new rhythm, seeing the life firsthand. The others were backing up behind him, so he set off, a proud stride no matter how he was feeling about it. Or as proud a stride as the cumbersome suit would allow. Even with its servos smoothing his movements, he felt he was lumbering like some antique movie monster. Lante, Lortis and Rani followed him a little shambling convoy over the rocks. The going was slippery and uneven. Their boots were constantly locking in place, soles moulding to fit the terrain. It was an undignified first parade for humanity, but at least the onlooking aliens were unlikely to take much notice. Baltiel stopped short of the habitat, waving Lante to enter and check that internal conditions matched up to the installation's redoubts. He would be last in, he decided. He would stand out here and take in the landscape, and hope for that feeling to hit him. Nothing between him and the sea rose past his waist. There were slimy, muddy humps, and there were rocks worn down by the constant patience of the tides. Between them was a vast network of hollows and channels, a single body of water at high tide, a thousand thousand separate ponds at low. It was a complex environment, transformed from moment to moment, the ambassador between the ecologies of the depths and those of the dry interior. If there was anywhere northern life might have become complex, then surely it was here. There were flyers overhead, like gulls. Perhaps they would be the seeds of intelligence. They were active predators. He'd seen footage of them swooping down on luckless marsh dwellers. They had a hydrostatic skeleton like most life on Nord and flew by rapid inflation and deflation of their broad veins a process that looked like stop-motion photography, and like they shouldn't have any business in the air. They were the most aggressively active things on the planet, the airborne lords of Nod. On the ground, there were plenty of things for them to eat, which would likely be the main subject of Baltiel's studies for the years to come. Hundreds of different lineages of radially organized creeping and swimming things called the Marsh Home, from the microscopic to the tortoises that could reach three feet high. Not actual tortoises, of course, or even much like them, but they secreted stony shells and lumbered about on tubular feet, placidly grazing, and the name had stuck. The players obviously liked the taste of them, when they could winkle parts of them from their mobile fortresses. Baltiel watched one now, mindlessly plodding over the path he'd taken from the shuttle. It had six legs, exuded and retracted in turn and six tentacle limbs it used to scrape and gather its harvest of sessile plant-like creatures. As he watched, the thing slowly let out an arm to touch the very ground Baltiel had trodden. Was some part of its limited sensorium encountering an alien chemical? The residue of his boot sole, perhaps? The tortoise seemed to spend a lot of time considering the possibility, 
but then it set off again, sloping down into the next pool in search of sustenance it could understand. He turned and followed the others into the habitat. They didn't seem to feel the same sense of anticlimax. The air was full of their chatter as they checked in with Sky. Bolfiel called up the latest on the Aegean and Syncope's idiot games. The ship was still dark. Syncope's crew were exchanging anxious communiques with Sky's people about what happened if it didn't light back up on schedule. We go in and salvage what's left, was the obvious answer to that. We find Dizra's body. Nobody was saying it. Everyone was thinking it. Lamte gave him a grin. She was a heavyset woman, her hair cropped almost to her skull, her skin ashen in the artificial light. Rani was shorter and darker, always slightly dishevelled. Even standing there in her suit, it showed in the cant of her helmet. Nortis was a tall man, half a head over his commander, with a dark beard held back by a net to stop it fritzing with his HUD controls. These were Baltiel's people, his disciples. Their names would appear in the history books, under his own. Ben Raleigh was frowning. The expression made it look as though she'd just remembered something she meant to pack. Too late to go back for it now. He sent her a query over their local net, and she linked him into a transmission from Sky. Repeat, he instructed, rather than having to replay and catch up. I said we've been getting the strangest signal from Earth. It was only on the news channels first, but now it's on all of them, every frequency. Sky's voice was glitchy with static. One moment it was the usual war stuff, then it's just this. Her image in their heart froze, the expression of mild puzzlement on her face drawn out and out until it became unsettling. Sky? Baltiel pinged her, sending a request to connect, and received a scatter of contradictory responses from the network. The others were casting sidelong dances, trying their own diagnostics and getting nowhere. For a moment, Sky's image was alive again, skipping straight from mild puzzlement to mid-panic. But the system, it... Stotter, freeze. Can't out with the shuttle. Han, Han, do you... A staccato pattern of flushes that hurt the eye, as though some message was being beamed through their pupils to scratch madly at their retinas. Coming down. I support. Someone. He's... They had no visuals now, just that one woman's voice torn up by static, far away and getting further. In the background was interference and feedback, and if Bolt Hill stretched his imagination, terrified screaming. Anyone! Sky shouted. Anyone! But there was no one, and a moment later not even her. Bolt Hill and his crew stared at each other, not quite processing what had happened. Each of them kept trying to connect to the module, receiving nothing but static, white noise they couldn't pass. The hell? Lamtes was the first human voice to break the quiet. Everything they had heard, they heard via their comms implants, which should have kept them all one happy family even at this distance. Is this one of Senkovi's jokes or something? Lortis added. He didn't like Senkovi much. Rani was tweaking the parameters of their instruments to try and get past whatever was blocking transmissions. Right then, Nobody really thought anything had gone wrong, not with anything save communications. Baltiel took a deep breath, knowing he had to make a command decision, but too short of information to know what it should be. The lights died, first the lambent illumination around them, then the dull red emergency lamps, and then last of all, the purple glow of the screen Rani was looking into. They were left with a residual amber radiance from everywhere and nowhere the sunlight from outside leaking a little through the fabric of the habitat. Baltiel pinged Rani, or tried to. He had no sense of signal sent, certainly no confirmation it had been received. He queried his suit. Nothing. He moved, feeling the full weight of all that cumbersome protection. The servos ground at the joints, refusing to assist him. A white beam flicked on. Rani had an emergency torch and was flashing it around, Baltiel saw her mouth moving and lurched closer. Suit dead. He read her lips as much as anything in the shaking light. How much air? Nortis must be half deafening himself. His voice sounded like someone in another room with the door closed. Can't tell. Rani yelled distantly back. All dead. Baltiel went to signal that they should have at least eight hours each, but of course there were no comms. 
In-suit exposure to the outside had only been planned for the few steps between shuttle and habitat, but he was diligent, as were they all. The suits had been topped up, that much he remembered. Except he was feeling dreadfully short of breath already, which was impossible. The pumps should have their own power, should be independent of any failure of the suit's systems. Unless they had been explicitly told to shut down. It was theoretically possible, as part of a maintenance cycle. Everything's shut down. An attack. Nothing's working, except us. Shatter, Nortiz shouted, lurching for the habitat airlock, which stayed resolutely closed. He fumbled for the manual release, winching the near door open, shuddering and gasping until he fell to his knees. Grimly, Baltiel took a leaden step over and found the emergency release on the man's helmet, cracking it open so that Nortiz exchanged the dying air in his helmet for the slowly dying air of the habitat. He followed by removing his own, gasping at the rubber-smelling pocket of atmosphere he suddenly had access to, and soon enough they'd all done the same. The hell? Lante repeated, clearly audible now they'd all decided to do the dumb thing together. The other two looked as though they'd already got it, Baltiel decided. Rani, definitely. Lortis just piecing it together now. We're all shut down, because it needed to be said, and he was in charge. An attack from home. An attack from 30 years ago. The war. We need to get comms back, Rani said. The module. We need to survive. Baltiel was already taking inventory. They had food here. They had water but they couldn't reprocess waste until they were able to restart that part of the system. They had limited air. Could they get the scrubbers and the pumps online? Could they get access to the suit tanks? Again, he tried to link to the others, to throw the problem to them and have their minds work on it in that virtual space between them. Denied. Again denied. Air first, comms second, he decided. Perhaps the shuttle comms survived if they weren't being used. Except the sanest, grimmest part of his mind was pointing out that the comms on the shuttle were open all the time. Of course they were. Why wouldn't they be? What's the worst that could happen? Why us? Lante moaned. Maybe it wasn't just us. But there was time for that kind of speculation later. In the end, they were able to jury-rig the suits to get the tanks pumping again, which was fine except they could barely communicate unless they touched faceplates. The habitat's pumps remained stubbornly silent. Rani reckoned she could get them working, circumvent all the parts of the system that had clenched and died at Earth's faraway command, but perhaps not in a time frame that would be useful. Baltiel had volunteered to go out and try the shuttle. They lost a room full of atmosphere letting him out, and he was wondering whether he would ask to be let back in. The shuttle was as dead as everything else, he discovered with no surprise. The airlock was locked down, even the manual release wouldn't shift it. He hammered on the metal of the door, indulging his theory on the inanimate so he could go back and be reasonable for his fellow human beings. When he was done ranting for the sole audience of his own ears, he looked round to see several of the tortoises watching this spectacle, this doomed alien invader come to their world to die. They had simple eyes at the lower edge of their shells, his memory reminded him but complex stalked eyes that emerged from the blowhole in the apex of their shell because they needed to watch out for the flyers. Now those eyes were goggling at him, making him feel that he was letting the side down. Just moved in and what would the neighbours say? So he marched laboriously back to the habitat and banged on the airlock until they let him in. By then, Rani had performed miracles with her suit battery and an antenna array and had what she claimed was a working transmitter receiver except nobody out there was transmitting, or acknowledging receipt of anything they were sending. The module was silent. The Aegean was silent. The shuttle Senkavi had sent his colleagues off in was silent. The non-functional habitat was a ticking clock on their lives, but they were on a planet within atmospheric pressure. If the module's systems had shut down, how long would Sky have? Baltiel was acutely aware that every single part of their life in space was mediated by computers. Keep trying, he told Rani. The rest of us, let's get the habitat air up. How much later was it then? 
No clocks, an alien world, the day-night cycle ran to just short of 34 hours and 17 minutes, Baltiel recalled. No suit gauges either, and so he made the command decision that they'd run out of air soon, as though it was a choice, a thing he could mandate. They hadn't managed to unfreeze the air system. One emergency tank had been hauled inside, tapped, used up. Lortice's frustrated brute force efforts had resulted in another tank venting its contents into the heedless alien atmosphere beyond. Without the scrubbers and recyclers online, none of it would matter. It wasn't as though the habitat just had huge reserves of air, it was supposed to keep churning through it, turning CO2 into O2 with a side of C. As they hadn't managed to, Lante's desperate pun, breathe life into that system, none of the rest of it really mattered. And so Baltiel had made his command decision. He would take the plunge, be the guinea pig. Partly he was responsible. His ship, he'd go down with it. Partly, though, he would be first. His penance, but also his privilege. Here he was then, another airlock full of stale, used-up air vented by the crude manual levers. His suit, smelling of sour Baltiel even to him now, smelling of sweat and even more of the urine it no longer recycled. The interior of the habitat smelled a whole lot worse. They'd all used the facilities, but whatever psychotic electronic weapon had been unleashed hadn't spared the plumbing. His suit was hot and cumbersome, servos biting his every movement, designed to protect him but now just a tomb in waiting. He looked towards the orange sun as it sank towards the mountains, in what had just been another direction once, but now humans were here, would forever be west. Or maybe not forever, just as long as we're here. So not that long, most likely. The others were watching him, not through screens and cameras with complex readouts of his health, but through the darkened glass of a porthole they'd wrestled the cover from. He took a deep breath, regretted it, reached up and unlatched his helmet. The lack of warning alarms was a curious relief, one dead system he wouldn't miss. He lifted the helmet off and placed it with groaning effort on the ground. That done, he stared up at the dimming orange sky and took a deep breath. Salt, ammonia, ozone. But beyond all of these, a melange of smells he had no names for. Things decaying by unfamiliar biological pathways, sharp living perfumes, hot smells, red and black smells. He wished more than anything in the world to be synesthetic right then so he would have some extra way to process the information his senses were giving him. He had expected the alien air to be pungent, ghastly. Instead, it was heady with odours his body could do nothing with. They smelled like something, like nothing. They were cocktails of molecules his nose had never needed to identify before. He heard peeping like minuscule baby birds from around his feet. A flyer flailed overhead, packing angrily at him. Something keen shrilly from far off. The tortoises gurgled as they moved, as though their innards were churning wet rocks together. He had not known. The drones and remotes had never heard these songs, smelled these weird odours. The atmosphere was heavy, dense and humid and hot like the tropics, save when the wind gusted from seawards and the acrid salt reek enveloped him and cooled him and stung his eyes. His breathing was speeding up. He felt the panic point of hyperventilation at his shoulder and forced himself to slow. There was less oxygen, but there should be enough, according to the numbers on the dead computers. A human from Earth could breathe unaided. Long exposure would result in a build-up of various chemicals the human body couldn't process, but better than suffocating, eh? And he could detox later when he got back to the... Back to the... Well, there was nowhere to get back to, was there? He fought his lungs again as they grasped for more sustenance than the nodden atmosphere had to offer. His muscles were aching too, working with that just too strong gravity. But he lived. He breathed in alien air, the same air that all these myriad little monsters depended on for their own incompatible metabolisms. He turned back to the others, or to the porthole behind which he must trust they still were. It was hard even to make a thumbs up signal in the suit, but he did it. He must have been able to see his grin. He was going to die, but he'd done it now. He was Nod's first citizen castaway. He felt a crazy streak of hilarity rush through him, 
and then panic because what if that was the atmosphere getting to him? Yusuf Boltiel was not a man given to sudden attacks of irrational joy. And yet he owned it, claimed it as his own. He had found the aliens. He had saved them from the depredations of his own mission. And now he would die amongst them. Now or later or in a hundred years, a mad hermit at the end of the human universe, talking to the tortoises and the little peeping things that lived in the black sand. He lumbered back and entered the airlock, which he'd left open because, well, why not exactly? He'd left his helmet outside. Perhaps some alien crab would creep out and claim it as a home. He wished the hypothetical preacher well. The others looked in through the airlock hatch with no expression he could name. They would watch him, like a hawk now, to see if something poisoned him, or if there was a planet-wide plague that could somehow jump not just species but entire evolutionary trees. Working slowly, feeling the gravity twisting his joints, he stripped off his suit entire, letting the dead weight of the thing fold to the ground as though he was shedding a cocoon and entering a new stage of his life cycle. He was going to try to sleep, there in the airlock and open to the elements, but then Lortice was banging on the window, miming a winch. They wanted him to close the outer door. He couldn't see why, but apparently they were going to let him in early, and that was a clear breach of his orders. Something else had obviously gone wrong. Voltiel didn't want to be commander just then. He wanted to be a castaway without any hopes or cares at all, and just enjoy the alienness of the air. A spark lit in his mind at the banging, though. He was responsible, after all. It was his mission, even in defeat. He signalled his understanding and laboured away at the little winch until the outer door was shut and sealed, then stood there as they pumped earth air in and gnawed air out. The earth air smelt worse, filled with bad odours his body was all too ready to identify. What? he demanded. The others all had their helmets off, soup tanks empty, the last of the emergency supply slowly going stale between them. He didn't need to ask anymore. He heard it. Rani's makeshift radio had a signal. It was tinny and crimped by static, but there was a human voice out there. Hello? Someone say something, won't you? I know I screwed up, but come on! A tiny, far-off Dizra Senkavi, coming to them from one planet away on a ship he had only now brought back to life. Hey, boss! What the hell? Pan, you can come back now. Hello? There were other shuttles on the Aegean, not close enough that the Earth air would last, but Boltiel had taken his life in his hands to prove that wasn't the end of the world. He held on a moment longer, trying to do the maths, but eventually he just smiled and shunted Rani out of her seat so he could speak to the expedition's prodigal son. Six. We. Have. Sample strange molecules. These of we taste stuff never known. Break it down. Build it up. Nothing like anything. Toxic. Energy rich. Fascinating. These of we. Recreate these stimuli. For others of we. As we meet. Interchanging ideas. And selves. None of we have encountered any such, not anywhere. Something new has come into the world. Present 1. Road to Damascus 1. Once upon a time, there was a civilization on a distant planet. The people of this civilization knew many things, including how to travel to other stars, and remake the planets they found there, with intolerance, into places where they could walk and breathe the air. But they were fractious, and just as they had reached up to seize the stars, they fell upon one another, and all their work was destroyed. Almost all. One of their scientists, the greatest mind of her age, or so she says, she does, and I am not in the mood to measure legs with her over it, you have decades enough, but portiered life is too short. She was named Avrona Kern, and she had a plan to exalt the beasts of her world so that they would know and adore their creator. She made a world for them, 
and released a virus that would expedite their evolution towards such a state of adulation. And she had a consignment of monkeys. And of all these things, that last failed in its delivery. For the wicked who made war on their fellows on her home also brought the war to her. So Khan was left in her tiny capsule, awaiting the call from the world below, which was devoid of monkeys, but rich in many other forms of life. For many thousands of years she orbited, so that what was left was not, deny it as she might, much of, of Rana Khan at all, as opposed to the computer systems she had bargained with for eternal life. And when the call came, it came from that world's new mistresses, the most intelligent, the most emotionally sophisticated, the most elegant of all its many beings. Now you're just bragging. We must assume that any life we meet will value sophistication, intelligence and elegance, or what is life for? Anyway, I continue. Unknown to the portiers, for as such they would come to be known, visitors were coming to their world. The civilization that had given rise to them had fallen and risen again, and at last, on the brink of extinction from their own vices, I'm going to put my foot down. And if you do, it will only prove my point. It will sound like a hundred thousand ants in confusion. And I continue. Will you at least preserve some dignity for the human species? A small fiddling of the palps to express resignation, like a sigh. Those who could set out in a desperate vessel chasing their knowledge of the places their ancestors had walked so very long ago. And so, they came to the world under the stewardship of Avrona Khan, or what was left of her. At first they came in need, and at last they came in war, for they could not understand the Portiids and saw them as monsters, and neither side could communicate with each other. And the remnant of Avrona Khan was mistrustful and remembered only how her great project had been betrayed. That is a very diplomatic way of putting it. I count diplomacy amongst my many understandings. The Portiers took the virus that had aided their evolution, which had allowed them to know one another and come together rather than living out their lives as single hunters, and introduced it to their creators, who were also the virus's creators, gifting them with the understanding that here too were minds who looked out and sought to know the universe. And so it was that peace was made between the humans and the Portiids, and a new golden age dawned, and the humans would forever after be not just humans, but humans with a capital H, which is a far better thing. And so it was, later, that the combined knowledge of these peoples would lead to a vessel setting out from Avrana Khan's world to voyage to other distant places where once humans had set foot and remade worlds, for faint signals had been detected from such places and they were eager to know new intelligences and meet with them in peace. Helena Holston Lane regards her companion, now crouching in an attitude Helena knows to read as expectant. Portiered spider communications, being a combination of apes stamping feet and the waving of two fuzzy palps, are always something of a performance. Helena feels quite mute in comparison, her body language coarse and huge, her lone voice lacking nuance. She was born into a civilization where her people were a tiny minority, a curiosity, surrounded by a vast population of spiders who speak to senses humans barely even have. She was a mere child when she began working on that barrier between the intelligent species of Kern's world, to overcome it in a way that the mere sharing of an engineered virus could not. The journey has a few more steps in it, true, that she has just listened to Portia tell an imaginative, biased account of their world's history, and her gloves and optical and cerebral implants translated most of it in real time, complete with subtext, personality and humour. Possibly a fair chunk of what she received was best guesses and gaps filled with human equivalents that were square pegs for round holes, but it was leaps and bounds beyond anything she had grown up with. Still, she says, you're going to have to find some way to not make us sound so awful. 
she sub-vocalizes into her own implants, her fingers resting ever so lightly on the deck, and her gloves patter out what she hopes is a good approximation of her meaning, direct to the listening feet of her colleague. But you are awful, comes the translated response, and Helena feels a leap of triumph, because even if some meaning is lost along the way, she's talking, even chatting, with a portiered spider in a way no human has ever been able to, save the same tood and mostly artificial, Avron Kern herself. There is an itch at the back of his head. Not the itch of the surgical scars, which an interesting cocktail of medication is keeping at a respectable distance, but something inside his skull. Meshner concentrates on it, trying to draw it out, his own eyes sightless and dark, because seeing actual real things is too much of a distraction, and his eyelid discipline suffers when he's distracted. Not coming, he announces. Give me a clue. He hears the tinny little sound of his lab assistant relaying his words to his partner in experimentation, and then that unique exhalation which is Fabian, said partner, going into a spectacular arachnid convulsion for the specific purpose of telling his human confederate, Meshner, just how frustrated he is right now. Portiered spiders are a long way from their ancestral state, both in size and biology. The original diminutive jumping spider did not engage in active respiration, whereas the current model funds its life by expanding its abdomen to drag air in over the elegant filigree of its booked lungs. What they don't do, as a rule, is sigh. By dint of great effort, however, Fabian has learned how to breathe in precisely such a way as to convey a human emotion. Fabian and Meshner have been partners in crime, scientifically speaking, for a very long time. Despite the barriers to communication, they have developed an idiolect of their own, mostly devoted to complaining. Then comes the rustle shuffle of Fabian's response to the translating lab assistant, and the assistant's uncanny valley voice saying, Picture the ocean. The assistant was designed and embodied as part of Avrana Kern's experiments in relating more closely to her chosen people, the Portiads. Coded to act as a spider male, it also speaks to Meshner in a male version of Kern's usual tones, which he continues to find disconcerting. The ocean. The idea passes deeper into Meshner's mind in search of that spectral itch, and for a moment he has it. Sunlight. Dawn? Gleaming on water. He gets the impression of structure, wood and webbing, perhaps a pier? Shadows loom at the brink of his vision, hard-edged. A faint rustle comes to him, Fabian making notes on Meshner's brain activity and the data transfer from the ugly, blocky implants that now make up a band around the back of Meshner's head. The brief moment of vision is gone, and Meshner knows his own excitement and then frustration conspired to drive it away. There is information waiting to feed into his brain, but his mind is an unruly mess, and so it cannot find a way to its proper neurological targets. Ocean, ocean. Images are there, but he knows them for his own memories, and clears his mind again, using mindfulness techniques developed from scratch. What if I suppressed my own memory accessing ability? He wonders. Could that work? There will be drugs that could render him an amnesiac for the duration, surely. Perhaps in that void, the alien impressions will come more naturally. Couldn't you give me something more... individual? He murmurs. I don't know if I'm getting anything through of yours. Again, Fabian skitters in terse communication, and their assistant's off-male voice reports. I wanted you to have something that would fit naturally with human experience, to make it easy. It's not working. But even as he says it, his mind whirling with annoyance and resentment, and the thought of another session wasted, he has a clear sight. A sea of a million blues. No, not even blues, a whole spectrum of colours that simply do not plug into the visual range he is familiar with. A sky that shimmers with the sun's radiation. A ground beneath his feet that breathes softly with the traffic of a whole city at his back. Except his feet, his feet were in all directions, his back, his eyes, his eyes! Meshner feels a sudden wave of nausea. The image, 
The sensory feedback is gone in an instant, and yet his regular body has not come back to him. His proprioception goes haywire, all sense of where his body is, what shape it is, utterly deserting him. He opens his mouth to speak, and his limbs spasm with palsy, sending him toppling backwards. Had he been sitting, standing, thrashing on the ground? His teeth snap and a sharp jolt of pain shoots through him as he bites his tongue. Then a sudden rush of threatening artificial calm bullies its way into his mind like a thug, beating down the rush of panic and cooling his blood. Meshner opens his eyes, knowing that he'll have a killer headache when the drugs wear off, and also that he might just have irreparably damaged his brain. His colleagues regard him anxiously, or at least the fidget of Fabian's palps conveys anxiety in a manner even a human can understand. Fabian is a brindled black and grey spider, with a body about the size of Meshner's head, currently hunched over a spindle-shaped console, with four legs making jerky adjustments to the program as he tries to mitigate whatever damage has just been done to Meshner's mind. Beside him is the lab assistant he has taken to calling Artifabian. It has the general shape of a small, portiered spider, much like Fabian himself, but constructed entirely out of plastic, alternatively russet, transparent and iridescent. It is a robot of sorts, with a dumbed-down copy of Avrana Kern's personality inside it, splintered off from the ships. If it is genuinely concerned, there is no way of knowing. Meshner stares at them, waiting for his eyes to focus properly. The headaches are starting now, the ones the medication never seems to touch. He suspects it's all psychosomatic, his mind deciding that he damn well should be in pain given the stunt he just pulled. That doesn't make it better. It only means he can't actually use anything to get the pain to stop. How's my head? he asks, and Artifabian translates for him. They could just use the ship, but having this one servitor dedicated to their partnership means it learns their figures of speech and mannerisms, its approximations closer and closer to conveying the complexities of each other's language. Meshner is fascinated by the way the device mimics portiered attitudes, with Fabian, it is plainly a one rung down on the ladder, its stunts polite without being quite deferential. When a female portier turns up, it is instantly obsequious, more so than Fabian, who is something of a boundary pusher as far as his gender is concerned. Meshner has read simplified children's histories of the spider civilization, Buchel in explaining that these days everything is fine and male spiders are allowed to play a full role in society. In practice, even human eyes can see it isn't quite as advertised. He has no doubt today's Fabian has far better prospects than the Fabian of a century ago, but the playing field still needs some ruling before it is level. I'm seeing information along the neural pathways, some small swelling around the occipital lobe, come the relayed conclusions of Fabian. Not good, Meshner. His name becomes a cavalier little flick of the spider's left palp, as though the creature is tossing a hat at a peg without looking at it. Portiered communications are short on those distinct meaning-to-movement correspondences, but names are an exception. Ah, oh, explains why I still can't see straight, Meshner complains. There was something there, though. I had a sniff of it. He eyes the spider. Hmm? He recognizes the gesture Fabian makes, because it is the spider imitating him biting his knuckles, a piece of human body language the portier had picked up on. It means that he, Meshner, is obfuscating, and Fabian knows it. We'll go again next dawn, he decides stubbornly. Dawn is a shipwide fiction, of course, but portiers like their day-night cycles even more than humans do. I saw the sea, he adds, although he can't say in his heart of hearts whether the sea had been truly from Fabian's memories. Can you give me something more portiered? Something I'll know is definitely yours. Fabian taps his palps together with an audible tock, a gesture Meshna has seen no other spiders make. It means he's thinking. The ship's archives have a whole library of what the best translation renders as understandings, a cornerstone of the portiered civilization. They are genetic memories, Meshna knows, rendered into something that can be inherited copied and implanted by a fluke of the pervasive nanovirus that guided the spider's evolution. 
If Fabian needs knowledge or a skill, he can simply have it introduced to his brain and very shortly be an expert. Meshner covets the facility, both for the way it could make any individual into a polymath and for the bridge it could build between humanity and their new best friends. He knows that Helena and the linguistics crowd are going about the same task by very different and non-invasive means, that his way is better. If he can only get it to work, if he doesn't scramble his brains trying. He is lucky to have a lab partner like Fabian who isn't averse to risk-taking. But then Fabian covets whatever academic success looks like to a spider, and as he's a male, that means he has to go twice as far on half the support. Fabian is doubtless delighted he found such an obliging test subject. Then Archie Fabian's meek pose changes to something bold and dominant, so that Fabian himself instinctively gives ground. The spirit of Avrana Kern, or at least the dominant facet that inhabits the ship's complex computer system, has seized control of this errant splinter in order to interact with its crew. The ship's mistress has sent out a general alarm, comes that female voice from Artifabian's speakers, even as the machine's feet tap out an analogous message to Fabian. All crew to the bridge, apparently. We've made a discovery. Waking the crew had begun in measured stages after the Voyager passed by the barren outer planets of the new system, homing in on the busy buzz of the signals coming from closer to the star. It had begun with Kern, or the semi-biological computer system that identified as Kern, bootstrapping herself up from basic functions into her full and acerbic personality, then progressed through the crew roster based on the ship's requirements, maintenance, medical, command, then everyone else. Both Helena Holston Lane and Meshna Austin Oslam should have been in this last category, but both had employed special pleading to be woken early to work on their personal projects while the Voyager decelerated. The Voyager has changed since they left their mutual home in search of a voice among the stars. Unlike the ancestral ships humans had travelled in, it has a fluid structure, forged from materials that can stretch and grow at Kern's whim. On departure, it had still mimicked what Kern remembered spaceships looking like, long and dynamic with a ring section for the crew's waking moments. Now it is something more like a manta ray, its delicate wings extended and fitted out as organic solar panels for when they near the star. The crew assembles in a set of bolus-like structures Kern grew for them, that whirl in an orbit just ahead of the wingspan, as though they are specimens in a centrifuge. Despite the best human portier medical tech, Everyone is finding the resumed gravity onerous. Helena and Portia arrive just in time for the ship's commander to address them. The Voyager's leader is old now. Portiards don't live more than about three decades, and Helena knows the commander kept herself awake longer than was her due in order to watch over her crew. She is an angular spider, with great tufted plumes over her main eyes that give her an owlish look. She is also a Portia or at least her name is so similar to Helena's friend that a mere human has difficulty in distinguishing between them. A lot of the other humans there are looking more than a little groggy, woken more recently or slower to recover. Helena remembers her grandfather complaining about coming out of cold sleep on the old Gilgamesh that had brought humans to Kern's world. To hear him tell it, it had all been waking up and then mad chaos and then going back to sleep again. Duly cautioned, Helena put more time into modifying her biochemistry and training her body, and practically bounced out of cold storage the moment they woke her. Portia herself confessed that waking for the spiders was a profoundly uncomfortable process. She was only able to work with Helena because Kern had given them a head start and only come to the humans later. The understandings that the Portiards rely on so heavily became disconnected during long periods of sleep, to return haphazardly days after waking. It was, Portia tried to explain, like constantly forgetting who you were, forever reaching for knowledge that was not there. Helena shuffles to her place, sure-footed in the padded socks all the human crew use because shod footsteps on the springy floors sound like shouting to the portiered's vibrational hearing. She wears the standard crew uniform that Kern fabricated, a shirt and trousers of pale green, the cloth filmy and thin because the ship is warm and humid, just like the planet they left behind. Portia is already signalling and chatting with a pair of spiders on the receiving team, who have been up longer than anyone, cataloguing the rich signals from within the system, and trying to make sense of them, 
whilst keeping a few eyes on the active and passive sensors to ensure that the locals don't sneak up on anybody. A literal translation of their department is alarmed feet, which still makes Hannon a giggle. It is also a salutary lesson that there are different layers of translation and literal is not always the most useful. She crouches and puts her hands to the floor, letting her gloves intercept the vibrational chatter between the portiers and her implants turn that into something resembling speech. Portia asks the two operators what's up. They are bursting with the knowledge that they have detected an approaching object, almost certainly artificial. They are about to get their first look at the handiwork of the locals. By then, old Portia, the ship's mistress, is speaking. And sure you've all been waiting for a gathering such as this? Anyone with any curiosity will understand that this is a heavily active, populated system. The volume and complexity of signals demonstrates that there is an advanced civilization based here, and the character of them shows a great many hallmarks of pre-collapse Earth technology and protocols. We may have here the second most direct line of descent from our founding culture. That is the spoken translation of the captain's message as relayed by the artificial ghost of Avrona Kern. With her fingers touching the floor, however, and her eyes on the flicking palps of the captain, Helena simultaneously receives the original. Her cybernetics and her organic brain provide her with... What this is, we have contact, as you will have all expected. Signal traffic from in-system is dense and diverse enough to suggest a spacefaring civilization that is still using old empire structure for the basis of its communications. Khan is both wordier and considerably free in how she passes on the concepts, and that sort of thing is exactly why Helena is working on her pet project. She feels a stab of annoyance at the coda the computer decided to add for its human audience to remind them just who was the first line of descent, in Khan's own view, whilst feeling some bleak amusement that the utterly inaccurate phrase Old Empire that her ancestors used to describe their own lost ancestors, survives as a spider term of reference even after Kern hunted it to extinction amongst humans. We are about to have our first look at an artifact of this inner world's culture, old Portia continues crispy. Our instruments have detected a fellow traveller in these reaches, an artificial body moving outwards at a considerable rate. Around them, Tightly furled plastic roses open up into screens showing enhanced views of the interplanetary traveller they are closing on. There is notation in the neat letters of Imperial Sea, which is the written lingua franca amongst the colonists, and in the slipshod and chaotic looking spider notation, but the floor also buzzes with technical data for those members of the crew with the feet to receive it, and for Helena. Perhaps because they had their understandings to lean on, Portiered writing systems are considerably less efficient than human. For new information, they prefer directly informative interfaces where possible. Helena assumes at first she has mistranslated what she is receiving and double checks against the screens. How big? Portia stretches out, soft enough that it is for Helena's hands only. An error, do you think? The Voyager has made quite a sharp diversion to get closer to the oncoming object's trajectory, ever since initial readings showed something other than a mere errant asteroid. Kern has husbanded their energy and fuel all the way through the cold dark between solar systems, but the ship's scoops have replenished their stores from the rich cloud of ice, gas and dust that formed the edge of their destination system's orbiting disk, allowing all manner of costly maneuvers. She constructed remote probes in her internal factories and sent them ahead on one-way journeys, each with a tiny splinter of herself copied into their cores. Now the data comes back, and nobody can quite understand what they are looking at. The approaching artifact is mostly spherical, with one very obvious exception. The outer surface is studded with a regular set of nodes that might have been sensors or engines or even weapons once, but are now little more than scarred, ice-frosted stumps and pits. One side of it has ruptured, and the innards have come out in a vast, jagged spray that flowers into fantastical spines and curling tentacles, as though some unthinkable oceanic horror has been killed halfway through hatching out of an egg 27 kilometers across. Ice, the probes confirm. 
its eruption from the interior of the object might be the result of a fissure in the unknown surface material, or else the freezing of a liquid centre might have burst the membrane open with its expansion. Either way, the colossal frozen eruption threw the entire object's centre of gravity so that the sphere and its miles-long plume now spin about one another with ponderous grace. The ice is opaque white over most of its surface, but the keen eyes of the probes find shadows within. Under magnification, some seem to be recognisably fish. Others are of a more uncertain shape, although that might also be the work of the expansion. An artificial moon, a moon of water, Portia suggests. Ornamental, perhaps? And is that damage we see from after it was flung into space, or the cause of it? Helena lets her palms touch the deck and sub-vocalises, don't let speculation run away with you, letting the mechanisms in her gloves make their best translation in precisely calibrated touch-speak, while the white dots on her thumbs add pulp emphasis. It is halting at best, and Portia says she sounds as though she is giddy with sweet sap, but progress is progress. The probes get the best look they can at the whirling planetoid, but they lack the ability to reverse their course and follow it, and soon it is on its endless way, heading along the plane of the solar system on a course that will one day see it vanish forever in the great beyond. Curious, says one of the alarmed fleet operators. Uninformative, the other complains, with a twitch of her palps that conveyed the subtext, and I had better things to be doing with my time. The captain calls up the relevant figures, wavering over whether to pursue the ruined object or let it vanish away. Relative momentum, energy consumption. Probably these quotidian elements don't sway her as much as the clear radio evidence that there is a great deal more of interest further into the system. A very silence and stillness is her decision, as physics whisks the object beyond their reach. They're going onwards. And yet... If we push on, we will pluck so many strings we can expect a response by the locals, she addresses them. Analysis of energy signatures leads open the possibility that they may be more technologically advanced, and also that they may either be fighting a war amongst themselves, or be naturally exuberant and wasteful in the way they burn energy. Helena is having difficulty keeping up with the rapid speech of the captain, and words from Kern's version keep creeping in. She fights to concentrate. Caution dictates we not risk the entire mission by proceeding further as a whole, or broadcasting our position. I'm having us move into the shadow of the closest outer planet. The screens begin to display the relevant telemetry. However, we cannot come all this way and not make contact. I've ordered a segment of the ship be prepared as an independent scout, fitted for a small crew. I prefer a crew made up entirely of Portiads. The captain is using the Portiads' own name for themselves, of course, meaning something like, we who know best, and Kern's translation omits this digression entirely. However, there is a small chance that civilization is both human and unaugmented by the unity infection, in which case human ambassadors will be essential. Small chance, Helena throws in through her palms. One of the sensor operators cocks a cephalothorax to eye her sidelong. There are no human representations within the decoded visual data that forms a large part of the signals we have intercepted, she explains. Mostly, it is just rapidly changing colours and irregular 3D shapes. Very fascinating. The captain continues. The scout will have a facet of the Avrana Kern construct, but this will have necessarily fewer resources to draw upon. I am selecting crew and human companions who have demonstrated their ability to interact with each other independently. This will be high risk. No guarantee that we will be able to assist if things go wrong. Participation is therefore voluntary. This is said with a brief, rearing motion. The captain's first two pairs of legs held high for just a second. It suggests that anyone backing out will lose status with the captain, hence with the mission as a whole. Portiates place great value on boldness, an archetypal female trait for them, with a whole dictionary of social expectations spilling out from it. The captain probably didn't mean to qualify her words like that, but some mannerisms are too deeply ingrained to shake. Helena's name tops the list of humans, but then this is exactly the sort of opportunity she has worked so hard to open up. 
The others are Zayin Alpash Vernix and Meshna Austin Oslam, also working on human portage relations. Portia is the next chosen, not just Helena's closest liaison, but exactly the sort of overbold all rounder that a female portier is supposed to be. Also on the crew are two other females, Bianca and Viola, who have been working with Zayin for years, plus Fabian, a male, with Bianca having overall authority. Helena listens to the susurrus of those around her, happy or unhappy to be out of the running. Unsurprisingly, nobody turns the honor down. Meshna had very much wanted to turn the honor down. Being part of a scouting mission will not keep him from his research, but it is hardly conducive. The captain's announcement fills him with a peevish annoyance he is entirely too prone to. He had assumed that Fabian was all for the posting, and only when they are installed in the outgrowth of the Voyager that will become the scout ship do the two of them have a chance to discuss it. Fabian too is not keen, the spider explains through the medium of Art Fabian. For his part, it is the potential danger of the business that he objects to. Let them leap into the fire, Art Fabian translates, them meaning female portiers in general. This is not a good use of my talents, or your talents. That last tacked on awkwardly afterwards, because Fabian, being a creature of easily bruised ego, recognizes Meshner as a kindred spirit. Well, we work closely together, Meshner points out weakly. The walls of the chamber around them deform as Kern, the chief Kern of the Voyager, manipulates the tensions in the ship's hull fabric to create the appropriate structure for the scout. So, if they were looking for that... Cha! The drone articulates, its reading of a little stamping tantrum Fabian has just indulged in. This is a punishment detail. Punishment? Our research is not approved of, Fabian declares. He crouches with his abdomen on the ground, tapping with his front legs only as he faces Meshna, so that his words will not spread to the others filing in. Nobody told us to stop, Meshna points out. Fabian's palps strike each other, talk. Well, no, but you've been spoken to, and so have I. In actual fact, there were quite a few words from humans and portiers, both about the accelerated pace of their work and just what it might be doing to Meshner's brain, but nobody took their toys away. He explains this, and Fabian scuttles closer, wrapping out a hard little rhythm. But that's how it is. Isn't it the same for humans? That's how it is for social species, the disapproval. The drone gives the word a peculiar emphasis, like a maiden aunt being vulgar. Meshner knows that Portiard society is far less formally structured than humans had been, but then pre-human humans had been the crew of a ship in emergency conditions. And humans were always more sensitive to their children getting killed doing stupid things, whilst the spider society seems to thrive on a kind of harsh Darwinism, because they have a lot of young and no real parenting instincts. He hadn't considered it before, but the spiders don't really force each other to do or not do things. They just express, as Fabian says, disapproval. We can still continue the work, he says, now feeling very rebellious. I mean, we'll have at least a year in transit to the inner solar system. We don't have to spend it all on ice. We can refine the experiment. We will, Fabian rears up, legs high in a threat pose as though daring the universe to stop him. A moment later, a couple of female portiers come in with the lean woman, Zayin, and Fabian is instantly all humility and submissive body language, just in case they feel punchy. Males have the chance to excel in portiered society, Meshna knows, but they have to work damned hard at it. Scientific advancement is one proven route, a path cut through the social thickets by Fabian's past. Oh, female portiers still comprise the majority of their great thinkers, but the precedent is at least there, and will make it happen, he knows. His eyes flick over to where Helena Lane is coming in with her research confederate, Portia. The pair are also working on the final closure of the gap between spider and monkey, at a very procedural, unimaginative level. They use technology to simply understand and translate signals and impulses, little more than having an artifabian in your skull. Meshner and Fabian's approach is bolder by a factor of ten, bring the portiered understandings to humans, 
find a way to translate them so that the anthropoid brain can grasp what it is like to be a spider, learn the skills, absorb all that stored knowledge. Outside the chamber, the superstructure of the scout ship is being moved into position and connected up, cables and flexible struts riding their way across the taut hull like strange writing. A seeding movement signifies the controlling computer's biological element being decanted, a ball of ants rapidly spreading out to explore and master their new environment. But they carry with them, between them and as the sum of their parts, another copy of Avrana Kern who has made herself a third species in this strange partnership. The scout vessel is duly christened Lightfoot, to represent the first tentative contact between the peoples of Kern's world and whoever calls this new system home. Their first stop will be the next planet in, the biggest gas giant, because long-range investigation has detected activity around its moons. Two. My interpretation of inner system signal traffic and activity supports the hypothesis that they are at war. Avrona Kern's precise, always slightly disapproving voice informs them. The Lightfoot's control system isn't all of her, of course, only a pared down version, but Avrona Kern tends to expand to fit the computational space available. Helena wonders if she possessed similar qualities when alive and in her human body. Portia beside her scrapes and shuffles, the words coming through Helena's gloves as, What are we even looking at here? War with what? Another waking, this, after the long step in system. And Portia is irritable and restless at the enforced inactivity. The Lightfoot has come in towards one of the gas giant's larger moons to find it. Under deconstruction is the only way Helena can think about it. The ball of ice and rock had once been about 40% of the size of Kern's world, and therefore of Old Earth as well, but has lost at least 3% of its initial mass. Closer drone viewing shows its outer surface riddled with holes and grooves. Burrows. It is crawling with life, all the more remarkable because it has no atmosphere to speak of. Any appropriate gas-forming elements either making up part of its frozen surface or having long ago evaporated into space. Surface temperature is, by Kern's scale, 250 below zero at the very sunniest, and yet it lives, and apparently makes war on its inner system neighbours. The drone moves closer, dangerously close, save that the locals do not react to its presence in any way. They are creatures of varying size, up to about half a kilometre in length, with the majority of them somewhere near that larger demographic. They have the form of something grub-like, but with dozens of stubby legs ending in hooked claws, with which they make a slow but sure progress about the moon. Their heads, or at least the truncated business at the anterior end of their bodies, end in a bizarre machine-looking assemblage that is plainly more than able to chew up whatever they run into. Helena watches them just grind their way into the ground, barely slowing from their waddle on the surface, their fleshy segments bulging and heaving as they work. Producing no signals at all, Kern remarks, on any wavelength. Their interaction with others in the system is restricted to their bombardment. Helena can hear her portier report too, which is as close to identical as it can be. Kern is concentrating on what the drones and the ship are doing, meaning she has less computing power to devote to personality. One of the lumbering monsters emerges from the earth its grinding mouthparts breaching in a shower of dust and rock shards that tumble and fall silently back through the vacuum to the surface. It seems to stare out into the blackness of the sky, past the curved wall of the gas giant itself, and then tucks its head in, claws digging into the substrate beneath it. Its whole body contracts, shortening by almost a third, and then by half again in recoil, as it spits a huge bolus of rock towards some distant point, enough to clear the planet's gravity well, flashing away at such a ludicrous velocity that Helena reckons some kind of magnetic acceleration must be involved. Its siblings are doing the same, tunneling, devouring more of the moon's structure, and then launching what they have mined at their far-off foes, whoever they are. From the state of the moon's surface, this has been going on for some time. 
The targets are locations within the asteroid belt that lies between this planet and the inner worlds of the system, especially the world from which the bulk of detected signals originate. Khan pauses over the word, playing with the end of it to show she is reconsidering. Targeting signals, Bianca announces. There are signals from the belts that the missiles are being directed towards, compensating for celestial movement. Quite some complex maths these mining beasts are capable of. The signals are being directed here specifically, tracking the moon. Bianca throws the telemetry and a string of intricate diagrams up the general consumption on the screens, and Helena reads the portiered representations from long experience. Spider diagrams tend to be four-dimensional, and place as much emphasis on non-physical connection as actual structure, so understanding them is something of an art. It's not a war, the voice is Meshner's, and the automaton beside him translates for the portiers. It's too far away. These missiles, by the time they arrive, their targets have had ample opportunity to dodge, unless they don't want to. I think that they're miners, just like you said, and rather than having someone come over here, dig up the stuff and take it back, they've seeded the moon with these things to mine for them and to spit the stuff home for their use. Says Khan, somewhat frostily, but then... Agreed. Helena wonders how much of her presupposition of war was based on the belief that the inhabitants of this system might be human descended, and on Khan's low opinion of her own species. Then, Meshner's companion adds something, a little tip-tapping that makes a single word Helena can't place, a name for something, given without context. A puzzlement is mirrored in most of the rest until Kern calls up some images of what he means. Helena sees a view, much magnified according to the notation, of a podgy, soft-bodied, caterpillar-looking creature with a bizarre, telescoping head-slash-mouth. But that's just a water bear, a tardigrade, she says, the words slowing as they come out. The resemblance to the colossal moon miners is persuasive. Fabian, Meshner's colleague, expounds, now that he has everyone's attention, in that slightly nervous, always ready to retreat manner that portiered males have when speaking publicly. They are notably resilient. They can survive hard vacuum in their native state, though not like this, only in a cryptobiotic form. But if you wanted base stock to manipulate towards this end, you could do worse. For the next half hour or so, everyone pours over the data collected by the drones, until at last Kern sends one in for a tissue sample. As the distant robot darts in to cut a strip from one labouring monstrosity, Helena holds her breath and waits for the angry retaliation. There is nothing, though. The creature seems not to notice, just grinding and spitting in an endless round. They must use some of what they mine to make body mass, she thinks. They must breed, probably parthenogenetically, to have this many of them. By then, cursory inspection of other moons around the gas giant has shown similar infestations. The civilization further in is greedy for ice and metal, and even just rock. The biopsy confirms Fabian's guess, though Kern has to send data up to her larger self in the Voyager to cross-check against the DNA banks there. They are looking at a piece of bioengineering, simultaneously incredibly sophisticated and brutally functional. Zayin asks the question most of them must already be thinking. Could we do this? Bianca and Portia are both insistent that portiered technology would be more than capable if such a recourse ever became necessary. The others are less strident. Meshner and Fabian bend close to their automaton to discuss and Helena puts a palm down next to Portia and buzzes out. Really? I'm not a biotech specialist, of course. Portia shuffles with a hesitancy that speaks of evasion. There is portiered optimism and recklessness, and then there are the hard limits of human portiered science. Helena decides that what they're looking at here, a self-renewing project that must have been ongoing for generations, is far beyond their ability to replicate and more, it speaks to a frightening sense of purpose in the culture that developed it. Purpose. Or desperation. Meshner has Artifabian enclose a section of the scout ship so that he and Fabian can get back to their work. The facilities they have brought over are limited compared to what the Voyager offered. 
but he is determined not to let it stop him, and equally determined not to let the collective disapproval of the ship's high ups slow him down. Fabian is of a like mind. The pair of them have been awake longer than most, and he is resolved to keep further cold sleep periods to an absolute minimum. The whole scout mission promises all manner of unpleasantness, but until they actually enter a first contact situation, the one resource they will have is plenty of time. I have isolated a selection of new understandings, the spider explains through his artificial namesake. These are from my personal store. Fabian means those he inherited as part of his genome, or that he took into himself from the Voyager's library before boarding the Lightfoot. The mark of a portier genius is not in what one knows or the mechanical skills one can deploy. All of these are part of the common currency of the species, copied, traded and absorbed with ridiculous ease. Genius, to one of the spiders, is either a superior ability to think on their feet, a particularly apt human figure of speech, or else the ability to take on a large number of understandings at once, and thus find new synergies between multiple skills and memories. Fabian is an understanding polymath, something that was supposed to be rare in males, but probably isn't. He has a good list of active understandings he can distill for Meshner to sample. The challenge is, Fabian goes on, to find something that you will know to be other, but isn't so other, but you simply cannot process the experience. We want to keep estrangement to a minimum. He pauses, confers with the automaton over just how his meaning had been communicated, and then adds, by which, I mean, you don't want to fry my brain, Meshner confirms. Delicious as that concept is to the imagination, Fabian agrees, and Meshner can only wonder if this is some peculiar portiered saying he's never encountered, or if Fabian is making another venture into human humor. Take what precautions you can, but we're going to do this, he tells his colleague. We're not going to let them stomp us. Of course, Fabian skitters over behind Meshner and begins checking over the node of the ship's computer currently linked to the human's cranial implant. Ants in my brain, Meshner thinks, though of course it is nothing of the sort. The ants don't leave the confines of the ship's network, but their calculations create electrical inputs that feed into the chambers of his cybernetics and thence to his brain. Human and portiered technologies mesh more readily than their cultures or languages. And it seems the technologies of these locals follow a similar pattern. The old empire is at the root of it all, meaning some common ground at least. If we had met something genuinely alien, we wouldn't know where to start. Right now, in fact, the Lightfoot is waiting on word from the Voyager, where the language teams have made some sort of breakthrough with the inner system signals. Perhaps everyone will be talking to everyone else any moment, one big interstellar community. All the comms are between Bianca on the scout and the command crew on the mothership, mediated by the various instances of Kern. The crew of the Lightfoot has nothing to do but wait for the news, which is why Meshner is getting on with his own work rather than just twiddling his thumbs. Theoretically, Artifabian could just have patched back into the network and spilled everything, being an instance of Kern. Meshner has discovered, to his surprise, that this is something the automaton is resistant to. It is its own little fragment of artificial intelligence, and to come too close to the intellectual pull of a larger instance like the Lightfoot's operating system could see it merged and stripped of its individuality. It values being itself, and what it has become working with Fabian and himself a unique intelligence, which sounds terribly rebellious and impressive until Meshner considers that this drive to become separate is part of the initial programming trajectory Kern gave it. Ball ready, Artifabian informs him, and a moment later he connects that with the tapping on his lower back that is Fabian himself giving it all clear. Go, he confirms, but at the same time the automaton says, wait, receiving new information. Fabian raps irritably against Meshner's back and he says, Just go. Start the process. The automaton raises its front legs partway, as though about to go into a threat display, but then freezes, apparently weighing its priorities. Meshner feels the familiar uncomfortable prickle at the inside of his skull as his implants begin parsing information. He has gone through their architecture since the last time, streamlining everything he could and adjusting the connections with his various sensory nodes. Now he finds a strange taste in his mouth, sharp and sweet, as though he's about to vomit. He clenches his stomach experimentally, 
but there is no other symptom. Abruptly, his fingers feel gritty, their skin coarse as he rubs them against his thumbs. The Voyager has instructions. Bianca is addressing us, Artifabian says, momentarily nothing more than a mouthpiece for the wider nation of Kern. Letter, Messer grumbles. He hears Fabian's palps talk behind him. A glance shows the spider keeping three feet and a couple of eyes on the instrumentation, even as he camps his body to listen. Afrana Kern has made a major breakthrough in respect of the communications from the inner system, the automaton says, translating the jittering of their mission commander. Concealed within the visual data, which remains impenetrable, there is a second channel of mathematical information based solidly upon old human notation. This has now been at least partially decoded so that we can understand information such as coordinates, flight paths, and some technical data, with more waiting to be interpreted. Armed with this knowledge and commonality, Joint Command sees fit to send us to make initial contact with the local civilization. Meshner tries to concentrate on the words, but there is a lot of white noise intruding on them, and it seems to carry its own burden of impenetrable meaning. His skin strobes with stripes of heat and cold that pass up and down his spine. How are my readings? He croaks. Fabian sends over a brief report to a subscreen. There is a riot of new information in Meshner's sensory foci, especially the olfactory and gustatory regions of his brain. Curiously, Meshner isn't tasting or smelling much of anything right now, but phantom touches jab at him all over his body. He hears a great ebb and flow like waves of the sea, and bright notes cluster around the edges of his vision. This is no good, he tells Fabian. It's runaway synesthesia. We've not synced the information. He feels frustration, because this is the core of the problem. Are spider experience and human experience intrinsically incompatible? It is proving a hurdle that grows with each attempt to leap it. Terminating comes the acknowledgement on the subscreen even as Artifabian continues to relay the mission brief. The Voyager is going into hiding, and the Lightfoot is going to say hello to the warring natives, Meshner blearily gathers. It seems like a terrible idea to him. The scout vessel will be utterly without support, but then the locals might be so advanced that all the Voyager would be able to achieve would be to die on the same hill. Given the reliance on bare technical detail, Avrana Kern believes there is a strong chance that this is a machine civilization that has outlived its creators, the automaton explains crisply. Meshner is having trouble processing the idea, but he feels strongly that any such artificial survivors would be less than delighted to find humans on their doorstep after so long. Perhaps they'll think we're a traveling museum, he gets out, the physical sensation of lemons and sunlight and blue suffusing his skin, spider life trying to force itself down all the wrong channels in his brain. Fabian skitters out some sort of message, but before Meshner can read or hear any translation, he feels himself slide sideways and loses consciousness. Zayin takes it on herself to upbraid Meshner when he is finally back with them. Helena watches her tear into the man, while the spider crew members stand back and either ignore their human fellows or badger the ship for translations. He'd been out for a couple of hours, the chief reason being informational overload. Helena knows what he is trying to achieve, and even supports the idea in principle. But Meshner is weirdly competitive, determined to make a breakthrough before some hypothetical rival eclipses him. He doesn't want assistance from her or Portia, he wants to win, or that is how it comes across. Zayin's own portiered liaison work is practical. Working in narrow, task-focused situations and building a gestural code to communicate swift, limited chunks of information. That is as far as she cares to take matters, and Bianca and Viola, who work with her, seem equally happy to leave human-spider relations to the field of just getting things done. Meshner wants to get inside their heads, or vice versa. Despite his prickly arrogance, Helena feels she's more on his side of the argument. I didn't ask for this posting, Meshna mutters sullenly. You could have said no, Zayin tells him. You can never say no. Fabian couldn't. He needs to show he's useful or he'll get passed over. So what? For everything, and I need him, so here I am. Meshla's eyes are bloodshot, 
and the skin about his boxy cranial implant is red and puffy. Why were you even on the Voyager? Zayn demands. Helena glances round at the spiders, but of course they don't hear like humans do. Speech is barely perceived by their vibrational sense, even human shouting, keyed as they are to other frequencies, a world in which the spoken word is irrelevant. Time, Meshla spits. Time, in transit. We were awake a lot longer than you, getting this set up. He jabs a thumb at his own head. We knew we'd get more done than stuck at home, dancing to everyone else's tune. Zayin opens her mouth to lay into him again, but then Kern's voice breaks in from all around them. Contact? Bianca responds immediately. Helena has her gloves to the wall in time to catch the trailing end of her questions, with Kern thrumming back that she has established a connection with an entity located within the asteroid belt that lies beyond the gas giant. An alien vessel? A machine? Bianca taps out. I am unable to say, Kern replies through the walls, human words echoing after for the benefit of those without Helena's advantages. But it is responding to the basic queries I have sent in, and not nearly in the manner of an automated beacon or similar mindless system. I am receiving a battery of inquiries, most of which I lack the familiarity to answer. I believe we have contacted a real intelligence, machine or organic. I am responding as best I can. Kern makes a rapid tapping sound to indicate annoyance, mirroring her exasperated human sigh, artfully reproduced over her speakers. I'm still receiving a vast preponderance of visual data. The comprehensible segment of the signal comprises less than 5% of the intonation load. She displays some of what they are receiving. The same bright patterned, constantly shifting, abstract shapes Helena saw in signals previously intercepted. They are hypnotic, lacking a recognizable rhythm, heedless of geometry, just broad swathes of flowing, shifting patterns, or rapidly shifting non-Euclidean objects, whose dimensions, textures, and arrangements change apparently at random, in bewildering, non-repeating sequences. Viola suggests that perhaps it is art, mere aesthetic adornment to garnish the functional message. The amount of bandwidth it takes up makes that unlikely, but that is a human porty judgment. Who knows what the locals believe important? Speculative discussion breaks out, even Meshner making a contribution. But Helena just stares at the patterns, their weird complexity speaking to her with a seductive promise of meaning, of familiarity. She has worked all her life to break out of her own skull, not by drilling holes in it like Meshner, but by expanding her viewpoint. She feels that if she could only push that envelope a little further, but no, nothing. Whatever the message is, she is missing it. Soon after, everyone is in their acceleration couches as the light foot shifts its angle of approach towards the belt. Kern believes she has arranged a rendezvous through exchange of coordinates in the locals' notation. They are going to meet the aliens. Three. Portia feels herself at the hub of a network of threads, stretched, taut and vibrating with alarm and excitement. Alarm and excitement would probably be the human translation of her answer if someone asked her why she had volunteered for the Voyager crew. Of all those on the scout mission, she had no qualms whatsoever at being chosen. Not just because she works very well with humans, well with Helena, who in her mind is not a particularly representative human, but good enough, but because the thought of the unknown, of cosmic mystery, of things to discover, motivates her even more than most Portiers. Her lineage is one of explorers and pioneers. An ancestress of hers stole the sacred eye of the messenger from the ants, back when the ants were the great power in the world and not merely a convenient operating system to run a Verona Kern on. Amongst the myriad contributors to her genetic code are aviatrixes, warriors, astronauts, and others, of course, more commonplace. But Portia's genetic inheritance skews far more to the daring and the groundbreaking. This is not simply a matter of a predisposition to certain personality types, of course, a trait observed in certain social spiders long ago on Earth, but a curation of understandings all the way back to the days when those skills and memories could only be passed down by the natural union of sperm and egg. 
Portia really is the sum of her ancestors, crouching on the cephalothoraxes of giants. She remembers the thrill of striking out into virgin forest where monsters might dwell, contesting with the elements, mastering the technology that opened the doors of the sea and the air, seeing Khan's world from orbit for the first ever time. And there is tragedy and loss and pain associated with those experiences, of course. But generation on generation, such sharp edges tend to get rounded away. When she was very young, she faced her life's great fear, and it nearly destroyed her. It was that there might be no more frontiers, no new branch to leap to, no new prey to puzzle out and conquer. There is a lot in Portia with which her far distant arachnid huntress ancestors might feel a kinship. But she conquered that fear, took it on faith that science and global ambition would conspire to give her the opportunity she craved, to stand and measure legs with her illustrious forebears and find herself at least their equal. Now she waits, always hard for her. The crew have been in and out of sleep as their whims take them, but Portia hates the waking, and so she has been staying out longer under the excuse of research. Helena is working on the theoretical side of their communications studies, refining the sensory inputs of her gloves and goggles, and training her brain to convert tactile subtext into impressions that make sense to humans. For her part, Portia is tinkering in a desultory way with the acoustic translators she can wear like panniers, and which give a very basic and sometimes howlingly inadequate impression of human speech. The drive to communicate is mostly the other way though. After all, there is only a small number of humans on Khan's world compared to a billion or so portiers. There is an implicit suggestion that the newcomers should be the ones to adjust. She has dismantled one pannier and is following some Khan prompted suggestions on how to refine the outputs for a more intuitive result. But mostly, she has her mental legs on those imaginary threads and is waiting for them to twang with activity. Portia's ancestors were not web spinners as a first resort. If there were a species out there uplifted from orb web spiders, its outlook would be very different, evolved to sit at the heart of a far-reaching world of its own creation, where the landscape speaks to it in its own language and it does not need to travel. Portia's tiny ancestors turned such perspectives against their non-sentient creators, forging the voice of the environment or sometimes even extending those artificial sensory organs into webs of their own that they could lure the original builders onto for ambush. The thought of waiting for that web-born message is therefore a matter of far greater danger and excitement. In the core of their minds, the portiers know they are not the builders of the universe's great web, but they dare to walk it and eavesdrop on its messages and turn it on its makers if need be. Her web now is made of the other crew, each one of them tense as a drawn wire as they close with the coordinates negotiated with the locals. Her web is the ship and its personality-filled operating system, and beyond and into the void of space, the unknown aliens themselves, machines, humans, something entirely other. Those who have a mind to are trying to make more of the library of alien signals, especially that baffling preponderance of visual imagery. For her part, the ship's version of Avrana Khan has sent spies ahead to the meeting point. These are not the same multi-purpose drones she used with the tardigrades, but tiny things shot out from the Lightfoot at enormous speed and containing nothing but the ability to detect and report. Everyone hopes this will not seem like hostile action to the locals, but if the locals are already hostile, then the entire arrangement could be a trap. Yes, this is why the Voyager budded off the Lightfoot, in case of such a betrayal. But that doesn't mean the crew of the Lightfoot can't do their best to avoid becoming such a sacrifice. Portia doesn't feel fear yet, and when she does, she will feed off it, buoyed by all those ancestral memories in which fearful things were overcome by courage and resourcefulness, and luck, but she tends to downplay its importance. She is well aware that some of her crewmates are less sanguine about the prospect. Viola agrees with the theory that the locals are machines, and believes that without organic entities to give them perspective, machines can never be good neighbours, as what can they want if not to make new machines? Viola is most concerned about a fleet of self-replicating machine probes descending on Khan's world in the future, 
led there by what the locals here discover after dissecting the Lightfoot and its contents, true included. Portia is frustrated with her caution. Shy away from every twitch and vibration and you'll never catch anything at all. On the other hand, the lack of enthusiasm from the two males on board seems altogether more natural, and she actually has more time for their naysaying. Fabian and the human, Meshna, have been winkled from their private research and are combing the alien signals for any sign of threat. They are both intelligent in their way, and being cautious and shrinking from danger is an archetypal male trait. Portia is well aware that to think in such terms, as most of her ancestresses have done without ever examining the thoughts, is unhelpful and atavistic of her. But it does mean she will accept a warning from a male far more readily than from another female, from whom any attempt to rein her in feels like a challenge. Attend, comes the instruction from Bianca, whose own personality sits somewhere midway between Viola and Portia, neither too hot nor too cold on the intrepid scale. We have sight of them. The threads are twanging in Portia's mind. She calls up the images greedily. Kern has done her best with the limited imaging properties of her tiny spies, but Portia doesn't expect too much. Her expectations are shattered to her joy. In that moment, everyone is staring and nobody is speaking. Not a spider foot or palp moves, not a human mouth flaps. There are seven vessels converging on the rendezvous point. Five of them are spheres, radiant with an inner light that silhouettes a complex internal architecture, like shadows on the face of the moon. One, the smallest, is a long teardrop that even now is tumbling, seemingly out of control, but, as Kern's commentary explains, actually in the process of commencing deceleration. The last is a fat torus shape, spinning edge-on towards its direction of travel like a runaway tyre. All of them are festooned with nodules and nodes that suggest only the teardrop ship has a facing, and the rest are entirely ambivalent about front, back, port or starboard. Kern's information, her longer-than-long-range scans with which she has kept an eye on these objects, suggests they have been decelerating for a remarkably long time, and to very little effect reducing their speed ridiculously slowly, rather than, as the Lightfoot will, waiting to get close to the meeting point before making that irrevocable decision. Some of the crew are suggesting that this shows a confidence in their hosts, perhaps even a trust. Portia has a feeling the practice has a mechanical imperative behind it. The smallest ship, the Teardrop, is half the average volume of the Voyager. Given that volume is variable depending on what Kern is doing with it, the largest of the spears is not much short of the frozen ruin they discovered on the way in. Huge. And they apparently manoeuvre as though they're even larger, given that gradual deceleration. Portia is intrigued. Behind those oncoming vessels, the asteroid belt is strung out across a vast region of space, far denser than any such feature in Portia's home system or long-lost Earth, which still means that it is mostly empty space, where the odds of any two objects connecting with each other is vanishingly small. Kern's best guess is that a huge icy body met its doom here, either a fugitive flung out from another solar system entirely, or a world that formed further out in this one, and was then dragged in towards the sun, until it met the grinding teeth of the gas giant's gravity and was torn apart. It left a great field of nothing then, scattered rock and ice smeared thinly in a ring around the sun, but extreme magnification shows that later years have added some jewels to this plain setting. There are artificial worlds there. Kern's best guess at enhancing the images suggests a scatter of pale bodies, like the spherical ships, but bigger. The asteroid belt has been colonized. Elsewhere, less radiant, there are installations that must be acting as spittoons for the distant tardigrades mining expectorations catching the missiles and processing them or sending them on. Could we do this? Portia echoes the past question from Zayin and, to herself, admits that they could not. And yet, we have come to them, not they to us. Always better to be the explorer than the explored. There is a buzz of communication now amongst the crew. As the light put in the aliens close, the signal density increases 
both the background hum of them from the Bells installations and especially from the next planet in the system, their homeworld, and direct queries sent by the oncoming ships, which seem more and more insistent about something. Kern is communicating on the technical channel still, but the character of those inquiries is changing. The visual element, which means nothing to anyone, is edging out the mathematical data until there is barely anything comprehensible in the barrage of demands. The only numerical information left over seems to be nothing more than sender ID. At about this time, Meshner completes a structural study of the alien vessels, identifying a variety of installations on their exteriors that might be weapons systems of different types. Of course, the aliens are far closer now, so that the Lightbook can assist him with its own direct analysis. They are closing on the meeting place, and it is evident that the visitors are not speaking to the locals in the manner they have come to expect. Portia notes that the characteristics of the visual chatter are shifting. The colours are becoming starker, with fewer blues, greens and yellows, and more blacks, whites and reds. The shapes are sharper, spiky with harsh textures. To human and portiered eyes, there is an implicit sense of threat. Khan is still transmitting her own signals, including a variety of old empire codes and conventions, but there is no sign the aliens understand or even register them. This is their primary means of communication, Helena states. Whatever they are, we need to send something back to them, something visual but simple. We have no idea what any of this means, but we're now picking up a common emotional subtext, or it might even be text. If we are all getting the same impression from this, and if they are of any kind of earth stock, I think we can take this as an accurate reading. They're getting angry. Viola, proponent of the machine intelligence theory, disagrees. It's not possible they could have evolved in such a way. Your speech, our speech, we learned to encode it first, turning sensory impressions into numerical data that can be read in and of itself, from zeros and ones to more complex codes. There is no suggestion that this data is encoding anything other than these images, and it's using old human conventions even for that. You're suggesting they leapt to being able to transmit their primary mode of communication without any sign of an intermediate stage that we might be able to detect and decode. Portia understands the argument. After all, the only reason humans and Portiids can understand each other at all is just such a simplified notation, which can then be built on to reconstruct the meaning. Without such an artificial encoding between them, the patter of spider feet and the vibrations of an anthropoid larynx could never have bridged the gap. And Viola is right. Those alien signals are pure visual data. The idea that an emergent intelligence could develop a technology like that without intermediate building blocks is beyond credibility. But then, we are dealing with the alien, she thinks. Perhaps they just did. And if they blow us up, We'll never know. She adds her voice to Helena's, saying, We must send them something, even if it is just to show we're not stupid. Zayin says something that Portia's working pannier translates as, Send theirs back to them. Terrible idea, Helena counters swiftly. If they're threatening us, we don't want to escalate. Send them a picture of us, Portia throws in. When that gets everyone's attention, she clarifies, an image of one of us, an image of one of the humans, or even just a human image in the abstract. They are using technology that is at least human-derived after all. It should mean something to them. Everyone has an opinion on that, and Bianca asserts command to filter through the stamping and shuffling. Portia already knows her motion will pass, though. The hubbub is just the usual yes, but I want to make this my idea, that she is more than used to from groups of the ambitious amongst her own people. Send an image of Helena, Portia submits, and that seemed as good a solution as any. Bianca confirms the idea, and Kern starts to transmit on the visual channel, throwing in a grab bag of blues, yellows and pinks, in the hope that these really are calming colours. The result is dramatic. The profusion of angry-seeming colours fades instantly, leaving only simple, more repetitive patterns of what Portia guesses are neutral shades. They're telling us to wait, maybe? Fabian puts in timidly. My spies suggest there is a great deal of communication between the alien vessels, Kern puts in. Calculate some alternative trajectories for us, 
Just in case, Bianca orders. Indeed, the ship confirms. I can't intercept much of the communication, but it is 99% visual. 97? 92? The technical channels are experiencing a large upsurge. I don't like this being a countdown, Fabian puts in. Bianca starts to reply. If you don't have anything useful to contribute, and then everything goes wrong all at once. The alien ships are launching dozens of smaller vessels, as tiny and fleet as the originals were huge and lumbering, and they unleash their weapons almost at the same time. Past 2. Land of Milk and Honey 1. There was a hole in the ice that, owing to the rampant volcanism Senkavi had set off along every fault line on Damascus, was still not frozen over when they came to look. Below, miles deep, the new batch of aquatic remotes found the wreck of the Aegean's shuttle. Han and the others, having abandoned ship at Senkavi's insistence, had not acquired a stable orbit when the virus hit their systems. Now they were cold corpses, in a half-crushed, dead spaceship beneath the ocean. Baltiel expected Senkavi to shrug it off, given the man's focus on his work and his pets. Instead, he fell into a black depression. He had played fast and loose with the rules, as he had always been wont to do, and this time it had killed people. It saved your life, Baltiel pointed out. It saved the ship, saved all of us. The Aegean, host reboot, was in perfect working order. As per Senkovi's pre-disaster plan, the octopuses had no access to its wider systems anymore, only limited virtual playgrounds to be tested in. The whole audacious, ridiculous plan of his had worked out in every particular, save that he had failed to adjust for the destructive stupidity of the rest of humanity. You couldn't have known, Baltiel tried patiently calling through the closed door of Senkavi's room because the man wasn't accepting electronic queries from the ship, and Baltiel's implant was still being re-engineered after the virus had shut it down. Only Senkavi's internal comms had survived, and he had set them to bounce back any traffic. There were precisely five human beings this side of Earth's solar system, to Baltiel's certain knowledge. He could not go on with 20% of his crew out of commission no matter how much he sympathized. True, the terraforming processes were running themselves for now, but that wouldn't last, and the entire Nord end of the operation needed salvaging. Most of the work could be done by automatics, guided sporadically by whoever's turn it was to wake from cold sleep, but the setup needed all hands, and especially Senkabi's brain. Lante has some medication for you, he tried. It'll make you feel better. Senkabi didn't want medication, Probably he didn't want to feel better. The shame and blame were jealous, unwilling to admit any chemical interlopers into his mental state. Baltiel could override the door lock and get Nortis to drag Senkabi down to medical, but he didn't want to be that kind of commander, and resentful, mutinous Senkabi would be considerably more problematic than a sullen one. So he had one card to play, not one he was proud of, but he'd read through the man's psych evaluations, and Lante agreed with him. I'm going to jettison the octopodes, he told the door. There was a pause, but he heard Senkavi moving around, and then, abruptly, there the man was, unshaven, red-eyed, and haggard. Why would you do that? Senkavi asked him. Because nobody else has any love for the damn things but you, was the true answer, but would not represent good Senkavi management. I wouldn't, of course, he lied. But they need you. And we need you. The human race needs you, Dizra. For a moment, Senkavi just stared at him, and Baltiel thought he would retreat back inside and close the door. Then he twitched, and the twitch kept going until his whole body was shaking, and without warning he was crying, Baltiel holding him like a child, Senkavi's salt tears staining the thermoregulatory fabric of his shirt. When they broke apart, Senkavi gave a shuddering sigh. Nobody needs anybody, he got out, in stark contradiction to what had just happened. But I'll try. Of course, there was no magic cure for depression. Baltiel still sometimes saw the man just sitting and staring, 
but he was working with his damn cephalopods again, and that seemed the best therapy for him. Baltiel watched sometimes through the ship's cameras, Senkavi sitting at the makeshift workstation he'd set up in the central hub, wires and devices floating about him, and his hair, longer and longer these days, a crazy Medusa's crown about his face. Or perhaps the waving tendrils of his hair made him somehow more relatable to his test subjects. Dizera would sit, hunched over his screen, and in the tank beside him, three or four octopodes would be working with the rubbery terminals the man had designed. They always seemed to be desultory about it, to watch them. They would descend on the controller and appear to feel it out, or to wrestle with it in a sudden bout of energy, and then slink off to hang in the water or cling to the wall. He had seen that one or two tentacles tended to remain connected though, pulsing and shifting across the controls, even though the rest of the creature was ostensibly oblivious. Then Baltiel would call up a display of the virtual space they were accessing, watching octopodes accomplishing complex multi-stage tasks in fits and starts, making unheralded breakthroughs, then cycling through the same fruitless steps over and over, then another abrupt leap forwards. He assumed that Dizra was trying to get them to follow regimented orders. That was the overall command in him, breeding assumptions. Later, he discovered that actually telling the damned mollusks to do things was something Dizra had given up on even before he left Earth. Instead, he was giving them long goals, identifying ends by flagging the conditions up with colours and patterns that apparently meant good things if you were an octopus. The methods were worked out by the test subjects themselves. When they seemed distracted, Sankaby claimed, they were employing something like abstract reasoning, free association of ideas. The individual arms, still at work, were their subconscious. He was unable to provide any academic literature to support such contentions, but he could provide results. He even staged a demonstration for the crew, a simulation of a crashed drone, its damage determined randomly by the system. Three octopodes were given free reign to work out what to do with it. Baltiel had watched with fascination as they had explored the wreck, accessed its simulated systems, repaired some damage while cannibalizing other functioning systems. None of them seemed to be coordinating with each other. Indeed, there were several apparent squabbles between subjects where they left off their controllers and wrestled in the tank. And yet a plan somehow emerged from the chaos as though deeper parts of their strategy had been agreed on invisibly at the outset. Or perhaps visibly, given the constant shift and glimmer of colours and patterns across their skins. The end result had not been anything that a human salvager would have come up with, less time efficient, but perhaps more sparing with resources. As Dizra pointed out, time was the thing they had. At the outset, while he had dearly wanted to space every damned octopus the man had bred, Baltiel had kept them around because they were plainly good for Senkovi's well-being. Now he was conceding the key point. They could be used. They weren't predictable like machines, but they would get a job done without oversight. Senkovi was already talking about future generations having the cognitive ability to set their own goals, as well as carry them out. Baltiel would believe it when he saw it. There would be future generations, though only within the artificial fish ponds of the Aegean for now. Damascus's expanding seas were carpeted with thick algal scum voraciously photosynthesizing, but the oxygen in the water was far too diffuse for the octopuses just yet, and not even Dizra was talking about fitting cephalopods with, what, hydrolungs? But when the water was sufficiently habitable, presumably his mollusk workforce would be ready. Human life on Damascus still had a theoretical future. The theory element of that calculation had shifted though, once it referred to Dizra's ability to bring the desired conditions about on a planet colder and damper than anyone had thought worth bothering about. Now, it referred to the colonists from Earth, whose nature had become very, very theoretical indeed. There were no signals from Earth. That was what everyone had to face up to in the end. Seven days after the disaster, Baltiel called everyone into the same room. The Aegean's systems would allow virtual teleconferencing from anywhere, but they had all begun to value the immediate presence of fellow humans. Only Dizra was absent, and he was at least actively linked in from his zero-gravity webbing in the center of the ship. Baltiel specifically checked to make sure none of his little friends were listening in too. 
he had a mad thought of one of the octopodes diligently taking the minutes of the meeting. He only told them what they already knew, of course. They were all bright minds, more than capable of having asked the same questions of the ship. Boltiel had let them have access to the information, even though some commandery part of him told him to embargo it. Still, he wanted to tell them face to face, because until he did so it would remain something questionable. Overall command needed to set out its position on the subject. There were no signals from Earth, he confirmed. Nor were they receiving anything from any of the established solar colonies. The great radiosphere of human endeavor had once been a constantly repopulated expanse. Now, it was a hollow shell, expanding past them into the further reaches of the universe. They would never catch up with all those lost words, and even if they could, the damn virus would be the first thing waiting for them. The last thing ever sent from Earth, by someone who, Baltiel was sure, had been losing the war and was going to take everyone else with them. They very nearly had. Sky and the four others in the module had died, locked in an unresponsive orbital tomb that had been reclaimed hour on hour by the supremely hostile non-environment around it. Running out of air, running out of heat, the remotes sent from the Aegean had cut through the hull but found only rigid, frost-limbed bodies still huddled about the equipment they had not been able to restore. Han and her team had crashed into Damascus. Baltiel, Lante, Lortis and Rani would probably have died had Senkavi not come for them. Not of suffocation, but likely of starvation, allergic reactions, poisoning. Or, if he was being dramatic, some hitherto unknown, northern super-predator with an inexplicable yearning for inedible human meat. So, perhaps Senkavi's mollusks had earned their keep already by whose mischief these last few dregs of humanity had been saved. That was the other reason he had called them in, face to face, to tell them old, old news. Because they needed to be there for each other. Because they needed not to be alone. Alone meant too much time to think about what had happened. There was not one of them who wasn't reeling. Baltiel could feel the echo of the news still resounding inside himself. It was too big to understand. And so he turned to his work, and sought there the meaning that the rest of the universe was abruptly missing, and he would bring the rest along with him if they'd let him. Senkabi still expected refugees, shiploads of them, and if such fugitives appeared, then the terraforming project would need somewhere to put them. In 30 years' time, Earth Standard, according to Senkabi's projections, they would have the Damascan seas and atmosphere sufficiently oxygenated. They would have a makeshift biosphere installed, based on the stable ecology webs from back home that were the late-stage terraformers' sacred text. Senkavi was keen to show how his octopodes would be invaluable at every turn, and Baltiel didn't ask the obvious question. What happens when the people turn up and take over? Where does your tentacle construction crew take itself off to? Baltiel knew Dizra was aware of this problem, but they had time to negotiate a solution so long as one of them mentioned that common knowledge to the other before the end. And Baltiel wanted to return to Nord. He was already programming their shuttle and remote fleet with a salvage program for the module to see what could be recovered. The Aegean's workshops were fabricating a new habitat, a working one. He had started sounding out the others. Lante was creeped out by the octopodes and possibly Senkvi as well. Lortis and Rani were both sick for the feel of something solid beneath them, and leery of some new catastrophe that might kill off the Aegean's systems for good. They would go where he led, he knew, and Senkavi wouldn't much miss them. Ever since Senkavi's naming of the planets, Baltiel's mind had sporadically spun up religious imagery for what they were about, or maybe it was the fundamentalist end of the trouble back home that put him in mind of it. The anti-science side of the argument had made Kern their Satan, and the terraformers her attendant demons, and now those detractors were silenced, or had silenced themselves. And Kern too, that remarkable, incredible, insufferable woman, one more voice still amongst so many. How she would have hated that. He could almost imagine her refusing to accept it, demanding a bespoke fate appropriate for her genius. So where did that leave Baltiel and his crew? All they had was their work. He had to get them back to Nord. He would be a chapter in human history if he could. 
but if not, he might be a prologue in an alien one. And perhaps there would be human ears listening, in a year, or a decade, or a century. There was no reason to believe the virus had been just one horseman of some final apocalypse. Except there was every reason, of course. He could remember enough of the prior transmissions to know just how much escalation his far-off kin had got in before the end. But in the absence of knowledge, he could avoid thinking about it and just go back to pick up where he'd left off. Prepping for a return to Nod would take time, however, just like Senkavi's work would take time. They were stuck on the Aegean, pending mechanical, biological, even geological processes. The cold sleep pods yawned for them, like the grave. Baltiel had a rotor, making sure at least one person was on watch at all times. And unless I want to wake up to his desiccated bones, I need to drag Dizra away from his pets somehow. Nobody had suggested firing up the drives and heading back to Earth. 2. In his own mind, Sankaby was known for his sense of humour, an organ that in truth amused only himself. Still, the others would have to admit that this was a good one. After all, he'd had his fill of being yanked out of dreams at the whim of overall command. Now he had an excuse to do the yanking. Time for Baltiel to know what it felt like. The others were busy with Lunti's malarkey, a plan that Baltiel wouldn't approve of and that Sankavi himself wasn't convinced about. It didn't impinge on his work with Damascus, though, which meant he could put off caring about it indefinitely. They still invited him to the meetings, virtual attendance only, but that was by far everyone's preferred option, which suggested that his myopic disinterest had been taken as tacit approval. Or they just felt that keeping 25% of their non-command colleagues and fellow humans out of the loop was bad form. There had been a regimented schedule of sleep and wake to pass them hand over hand through the years since the silence, which was apparently what they were calling it. Sengavi felt that was overly dramatic, but Rani had a poetic streak in her. The idea was that Sengavi would pop in and out on schedule based on the terraforming stages that needed executive oversight, and the others would wake in shifts at the same time in an overlapping pattern, so that three out of five humans were awake at any given time. The brief for the others was, one, oversee salvage of the module and reconstruction of the Nord expedition. Two, help Senkovi. And they had helped, and even more to his surprise, he had been profoundly glad to have other humans to occasionally complain to. What you don't know you'll miss until it's gone, number 153, the human race. Lante in particular was something of a whiz with eco-structure, and Rani was a better pilot, shuttle or remote, than anyone else. The best in the universe, perhaps. Lortis, for his part, was good with the octopi. They liked him, and unlike the others, didn't squirt water at him when he approached the open tanks up in the rotating ring. He even went diving with them, the only one other than Senkovi, and acted as a stooge in their training sessions. Senkavi wished sometimes he could actually talk to the man about it, about their evolving relationship with the evolving octopi. Lortis wasn't a man who opened up about his feelings, though, and for Senkavi's part, he found it easier to communicate with the cephalopods. And that was saying something, because actual conversation was proving elusive. He could encourage them towards tasks and goals, visually flagging up things for them to be curious about, and then letting them grasp the problem and solve it with minimal assistance. He saw them talking to each other constantly, skin strobing at skin, tentacles touching, fighting, intertwining. At the same time, he couldn't be sure they were saying anything. How much was meant, and how much of that riot of activity was just a byproduct of cognition? He stood by the tanks sometimes, watching his pets, his creations at work, at play. They watched him back. They knew him, and he felt they liked him. Even unmodified octopi could tell individual humans apart, and these were smarter than their forebears and only had five faces to recognize. He was depressingly aware that he was trying to wring something from his pets that would be available for free from his fellow humans, but a lifetime of habits died hard, and he hadn't been able to cross that barrier even when he shared a planet with billions. It hardly seemed worth it on a ship with only four others and two of them asleep at any one time. 
and the octopi slept too when Zenkavi took to his cold bed. He didn't have the apparatus to properly suspend them, he could only cool and drug them into an unreliable hibernation. Mortality in the cold dark between had been 60% at first, and he'd massaged it down to 40. It broke his heart every time his time was up. Doing something long term about that particular issue was one of his biggest goals, perhaps soon to be realized. Thoughts of sleep and waking brought him back to Boltiel. The wake-up sequence was already advanced. Senkabi had looked into the files and discovered that his boss liked to be awoken by soft music, gradually swelling to a tear-jerkingly magnificent crescendo. Senkabi found that mawkish, but others would probably not be delighted by his own maritime imagery, and so each to his own. He watched the man's eyelids twitch, his muscles flickering in tiny spasms as the sleep chamber went through all the necessary checks and adjustments for a shock-free reanimation which was a shame because the designer hadn't allowed for Senkovi. Boltiel woke, stepping from his symphony into the Aegean's warm light, sitting up and seeing he was not alone. Senkovi had to hand it to him. Boltiel almost masked the horror and panic of that moment. His overall command face slammed down, but not quite fast enough, and the eyes couldn't lie. Boltiel clutched too hard at the edge of his pod and said nothing. Looking over Senkovi's withered face, the wild tufts of his white beard, his liver-spotted scalp, warty and draped with a few brittle hairs. They stared at each other for a long time, and Senkovi wondered if Lante or Nortis were watching on the cameras and killing themselves with laughter, or unable to believe his bad taste. But if you couldn't laugh, what could you do? Ew. Bortiel's voice had a shake to it at the start, but the man tamped down and made it sound strong. What happened? A suspicious squint started about Bortiel's eyes, and Senkovi could hold the grin back no longer. Seeing the boss about to beat him to the punch, Senkovi ripped the beard off and began peeling away the skull cap and wrinkled skin sections, snickering to himself. Bortiel must have interrogated the ship by then and found out that he'd been under for eleven years, in the increasingly meaningless way the ship told time. How long did you... he asked. 34 days. So could be picked at one stubborn scrap of fake wrinkle. The skin was the easy bit. Getting the workshops to spin a realistic beard was remarkably difficult. You've amused yourself sufficiently? Altiel obviously wanted to shout at him but was restraining himself masterfully. I'm amused. Aren't you amused? In hysterics. The boss rubbed at his neck and rolled his shoulders, things that shouldn't have been necessary, but they were relying too much on the cold sleep and it was beginning to show. I assume you had some real reason for dredging me up, beyond trying to kill me with shock. Well, several things have accumulated that probably need a command decision or two, Sinkerby admitted. Lante wants to talk to you, certainly, she's got a whole uh, thing going on. He saw Baltiel's face change as the man accessed the initial files on Lante's thing. Lante and Boltiel were going to have an argument soon. Senkovi had warned her it would be a hard sell to the boss. Still, none of his business. And when the main debate had been raging between Lante and Rani about broaching the thing with Boltiel, Senkovi had been deep in designing his beard. Oh, and there's the module. That needs a decision. How's the refit proceeding? And even as he asked the question, Boltiel was hunting the answers through the system doubtless tutting over the fact that in his absence nobody put data back quite where it should be. Yes, well, Sengabi said, wringing his beard. Nobody wants to trust it, even though the virus has been flushed out. Bloating in a tin can and all that. On the plus side, the Nord expedition is mostly good to go, they told me. Even got a cold sleep system set up planet side if you want to do a longitudinal study or two. Sengabi got an alert to tell him Boltiel was querying the progress on Damascus. At least he had good news there, he felt. Everything proceeding apace, oxygenated zones spreading, and the microbial ecosystem established and apparently stable. He even had a working elevator cable, because the thought of dropping living things from orbit into the sea made him shake and sweat, no matter how he tried to tell himself it wasn't the same. He couldn't even airdrop a bacterium these days. I'd better speak to the others, Baltiel said grimly. Everyone's up and waiting for you, boss, Zinkaby told him. It was a breach of Boltiel's rules, of course, to have them all awake at the same time, but not as much as what was about to be proposed.
Baltiel could see Lamte was ready for a fight, and the body language of Rani and Lortis suggested the three of them were committedly all in it together. The brief walk from the sleep pods to the crew room had been long enough for him to absorb just what extended treachery had been going on while he'd been out of it. But Lamte had obviously done all the convincing in person rather than conveniently producing a manifesto. If he had time, he could trawl the internal sensor suite and maybe find recordings of some of the conversations, but he'd just have to hear it from Lante herself and deal with it on the fly. But first thing was first, and so he was urbane mildness personified as they talked over what had been reinstalled in the orbital module, whether they needed to do anything to stop it falling into Nod's gravity well, whether they were going to set up shop there or not. Lante subsided and Rani took over with the technical details. Balthiel rubber-stamped all the various proposals, command decisions barely worthy of the name. Now, he said, that disposed of. You've been busy. For a moment, the tension in the room was almost overtly mutinous. He wondered how far they would go. Nobody's come, Lante told him. I mean, yes, they could still be on the way. They could have set off late. They could be in ships without the same acceleration as the Aegean. Or something. And maybe the reason we've not had any comms from them, asking if we can put them up and find a bunk for them, is because they're super paranoid after the viral weapon. Or assume we're paranoid. Or assume we're dead. But we've been sending signals homeways, and there's nothing. There's been... Her hand waved away accuracy. Time for those signals to get all the way to Earth and for Earth to call us back. Nothing. We don't think anyone's coming. And it didn't prove anything. Just as she said, survivors could be creeping their way between stars under radio silence. Except Lumpty didn't think so. She was nailing her colours to, we don't think anybody made it. What really brought it home was that he knew they'd all stopped counting. The Aegean was technically still running a clock on how long it had been since the silence and the last words of Earth, but Baltiel could see from the records how long it had been since anyone had even queried it. Their jaunts in and out of cold sleep had given time a rough edge that had finally soared through their last connections to their home planet. If he asked them now, not one of them would be able to say how long it had been. And now this. And so you... Altil was about to say decided to play God, but that meshed too neatly with his own viewpoint, or maybe the damned religious memes Senkabi had infected him with, and he resorted to plain science. So you co-opted the genetics lab. In my spare time, of which we've had rather a lot, and Lante was looking visibly older, not old because they all had the kind of cleaned up genome that lent itself to extended healthy lifespans, but she'd plainly been putting the hours in, and the days and years. We have genetic samples from most of the crew in store anyway in case of mishap. It's all established science. Banned science? For most of a century long before the anti-science mob became a real danger. The creation of artificial human beings had been forbidden for a number of reasons, from divine prerogative through to fending off the return of slavery. Lante shrugged. We all know the arguments, uh, almost none of which apply. Yusuf, you want to study Nod, fine. Senkovi wants to breed his pets and terraform Damascus, also fine. Feel free to add to the store of human knowledge. I, we, want to ensure that human knowledge has a future. I notice that you've sequenced several modified genomes, not quite the human standard. Lante squared her shoulders. Adaptation to a low oxygen environment is within human standard range, originally in high altitude areas, but it will suit not well. And I know what you said, you don't want a bunch of colonists to turn up and ruin the ecosystem there. But these won't be colonists, they'll be our people. We can guide them, teach them. We can make a human reservation, Yusuf. Just one part of the planet. And it would never stay that way. Not over the generations, but forever. And the purist in him reared its head and bellowed, while the man, the vain man he acknowledged himself to be, thought about that perpetuation of human knowledge, new histories that knew his name. And the rest, he prompted Lante gently, or are gills also human standards somehow? We're terraforming a planet that is almost entirely ocean, Lante pointed out. Hey, what? 
Senkavi had been mentally elsewhere, slouching against the wall and ignoring the conversation, but that hooked him. You want to? He looked from Lante to Baltiel and then made a sulky face. Oh well, I suppose that's what it's for. And now was thinking boats. Baltiel had a good idea what Senkavi was thinking, and decided to set up some routines in the Aegean's systems in case the man went entirely mollusk native on them. Routines that Senkavi hopefully wouldn't be able to just circumvent. For now, though, he needed a response to Lante and the others. I am a jealous god, he thought. That would be his standard party line, and it should have been frozen into him by the years in cold sleep. His attitudes crystallized until he was little more than a parody of himself. And yet, and yet. He examined his knee-jerk rejection of Lante's mad, bold plan, and found it nothing more than that. No substance behind it. We'll put them on Damascus as much as we can, he said, knowing that even if he wasn't such a jealous god, there was going to come a time when Zeus would go head to head with Poseidon over departmental demarcation. On boats, as much as we can. It was an attempt to placate Senkavi as much as one ever could. But we'll be on Nod, so I suppose you'll be doing the initial work there. They had been so tensed for a scrap over this that Lortis actually physically staggered as they were leaning against a door unexpectedly open. Baltiel shrugged. Just don't think about Nord as a colony world. The soil won't grow anything people can metabolize. The entire biosphere is wrong for us, and we're not changing that. And I've seen your work, briefly, on the walkover. You can't make humans who could live there like natives. Low O2 and high grav mods won't cut it. They wouldn't be human once you'd finished making all the changes. Lante obviously felt that was defeatist talk, but she recognized the value of taking the victory he offered, rather than risking everything on pushing for more. And Baltiel reckoned he was right. Nodden biochemistry was alien from the ground up, a cocktail of elements hazardous to people and organic molecules that might have arisen on Earth but never did, out-selected by chance and time. There were probably some Earth extremophiles that could scrape a living there, but nothing more complex than that. Earth and Nord biology were ships that passed in the night without signal or hail. 3. Salome is not fond of the elevator and halfway down does her best to escape it. Her co-prisoner on the journey down, Paul, feels alarm, jetting towards the top of the capsule and clinging to the plastic sheathing. Technically, he is Paul 51, and she is Salome 39, as per Sinkaby's notes. His numbering of generations is eclectic, however, unreliable. There have been coexisting Pauls, and of course Pauls 1 to 3 lived back on Earth in his aquariums. Any guilt he might have felt about poor bookkeeping went the way of the rest of the human race. As long as he understands his notation, nobody else is likely to care. Paul has gone almost white, with black and purple patterns flickering and dancing at the edge of his mantle. Externally, he's much the same as the earliest Pauls, a football-sized body that is mostly stomach and brain, eight muscular tentacles ridged with suckers on the underside, surrounding a remarkably powerful beak. Internally, he is a melange of ancestral genetics and the tweaks of the Rus Khalifi virus. The virus, it will be remembered, was intended as an uplift tool. Khalifi and Roos started with the assumption that any sane researcher would want to tentatively nudge a mammalian species closer to human cognition. Senkabi has, therefore, not simply been dosing the tanks with it and hoping to wake up to vaguely tentacled humanoids able to discuss the nature of existence. Instead, he has used minimal and selected nanoviral samples to tweak, with his best guess, certain parameters of his subject species' worldview. His belief has always been that he has merely assisted the clock of nature into moving a little faster. But Dizra Senkavi is not the best for unbiased introspection. In this case, though, it is impossible for such a self-focused man to create in his own image. Take Paul's alarmed state. Paul is connected to the elevator systems, which contain the information, organized pictorially, in a code Senkavi has painstakingly worked out as being something his pets can usually grasp, that if Salome succeeds in overriding the safeties, 
then they will both find themselves outside, meaning miles over the surface of Damascus, along with the rapidly dispersing watery environment currently sustaining them, and with about the same chance of survival as a bowl of petunias placed in the same predicament. Hence Paul's alarm. But Paul himself, the brain that is the center of Paul, is in no position to appreciate the cause and effect physics of this. He just knows that he is frightened and that Salome's actions are the cause. His fear is written across his skin for her to read, and she does, but not as a signal he consciously intends to send. His skin is the chalkboard of his brain, where he doodles his thoughts and feelings from moment to moment. If he wished to be deceptive, he could fight himself for control of his own canvas. But right now, he is more than happy for Salome to know just how stressed she is making him. So where does the understanding lie of their impending doom? Within the wider network of his nerves, perhaps. Within and between the individual subcenters of neurology that control his arms, a semi-autonomous battery of processing power that Paul's brain lives in partnership with, and that makes his subconscious, insofar as he has anything humans would recognize as one, a powerful and world-affecting thing. In just such a way, Salome, mottled red and angry purple, her skin pricked up into thorns and daggers, just knows she wants out. This is not her tank. Where are her games? Where are great large entity and calm large entity? System ID tags Senkavi Lortis, respectively. What is this sense of motion and fluctuation of pressure within the water? Her brain proposes, her arms dispose. She is linked to the schematics of the capsule herself. The submines of her arms grapple with the shape of it, turning it about and seeing where pressure can be applied to crack it open. She begins a saying commands, and though all of her taken in aggregate as the entire picture of her predicament, her active understanding is simply that she wants out, and here and here represent a way she can accomplish this. The greater drop outside eludes her, irrelevant to her priorities. Paul then, his own arm-driven undermined, his reach, as opposed to the crown of his central brain or the guise of his skin, understands that to remove the fear he must prevent Salome from accomplishing her own goals. At first, he simply signals this automatically, initially broadcasting a directionless fear, but then adding qualifiers of color and texture so that Salome understands she is the source of his anxiety. Normally, this would be in response to her threatening him and indicate capitulation. But the raised walls and darts of Paul's malleable skin show that he means anything but. Salome cocks an eye at him, reading his intent very clearly, and doesn't really care. She is bigger than Paul. What's he going to do? What he does, against millions of years of instinct, is try to attack her. He flushes his skin dark with angry courage, raises a hundred jagged crests across his body and jets towards her. They wrestle furiously, a boneless strangler's writhing. Unlike vertebrates, they have no proprioception, no mental picture of where all the parts of their bodies are. Eight arms that can bend in any direction at any point would tax the processing power of the Aegean, let alone an octopus brain. The crown sets strategy, but battlefield tactics are the province of the reach, those subnodes that run the arms. A fight like this would usually end with a submission, one combatant jetting away, perhaps with an arm less. Alternatively, a death. They are quite capable of strangling or devouring one another. The Khalifi and Rus meddling has had one effect though. They are a more social species than they were and societies are built on shared signals and information. Abruptly, they break apart by mutual agreement, retreating to the far ends of the capsule. Salome starts work on circumventing the safeties again, then stops, starts, and then stops. She has a new idea, relating to the physics of what happens if a space elevator car unexpectedly bursts open at high altitudes. Her crown's grasp of this is limited, simply that now the idea of breaking out triggers a burst of chemical signals flagging up danger. 
In her mind, the consequence of breaking out is like a shark circling the descending capsule, a threat waiting to get her. Her reach would have a more concrete understanding of the issue, feeling out the shape of it until the variables were all known. But the reach has limited agency of its own, and its reasoning is not apparent to the part of her that considers itself the individual that is Salome. She reconsiders her course of action and sulks at the bottom of the capsule. Clinging to the top again, Paul slowly regains healthier shades. Four. The vast wealth of data on the Nod biosphere, collected over so long by the orbiting module, had been lost in the silence. The virus had devoured it. Those far-off fanatics who had coded the monster had not dreamt of what their spite would erase. Probably they wouldn't have cared. A piecemeal copy had survived on the Aegean, buried in the comms record between the two installations, although Senkovi had only uncovered this after the work had begun anew. Maltiel knew, intellectually, that time was the one thing they had, but the loss of knowledge remained profoundly frustrating. But they were down now, he and the others. They were down with a new shuttle, the other vessel having been dismantled by remotes, with its systems incinerated in a fit of caution, and firmly based on the ground. Lunti was already talking about how to go about farming new people, she could mix up viable genetic signatures by randomly recombining the genomes she had. But now she was wrestling with how to actually raise the resulting infants. It wasn't as though they would spring up like magical warriors of myth, ready to start being fully formed humans. She was working on tutelary programs, but Baltiel kept dropping socialization into the conversation, and Lanti, for all her drive to continue the species, didn't want to actually play mother to it. The surviving terraformers were not a good representative cross-section of humanity. After all, they had volunteered for a mission that would take them light years from home and sever them from human society for a lifetime. None of them were stay-at-home family types. Which didn't mean that Lante, Lortis and Rani weren't having some three-way fun time when they thought he wasn't looking, but Baltiel didn't care about that if it helped them stay stable and happy. If he'd wanted, possibly they'd have made it a four-way, but for most of his life, he had focused on forming close work bonds that paid no heed to gender and never became possessive or physical. He suspected that it was that attitude that had recommended him for overall command. They had remotes out, aerial and ground, taking fresh samples of the salt marsh fauna, and he was helping the new habitat computer integrate the data with Senkovi's recovered archive eliminating repetition and making new connections they had missed the first time round. For her part, Lante was acting as his hands in the habitat's laboratory, dissecting those select specimens he deemed necessary in order to try and understand even the basics of the Norden biology. They had already marked several unearthly characteristics of the alien world, notably the radial symmetry. Evolutionary theorists on Earth had assumed that a front and a back were on the cards for a complex animal. Apparently, Nod was the exception to that rule. Baltiel paged between archive sections, navigating from the big picture Balplan category to more specific topics. Nod, bio, neurology, overview was next on his list, a topic curated by Lante. He skimmed the abstract. Based on imaging of live specimens of species 1, 3, 5, 6, 11, 19, and dissection of species 3, 6, and 19, all analyzed species show a distributed ring-shaped system of nerve analogues with transmission of signals from cell to cell accomplished by way of a mechanism involving concentration of polarized calcium ions, not currently fully understood. Sensory processing must somehow take place across the neural net. The closest analogue to a brain in most species is a concentrated band, but the whole nervous system is more homogeneous than that of Earth species, and possibly the entire system acts as a single brain, or none of it does. Experimental procedures for testing the limits of specimen response to complex stimuli under review, pending proposals for appropriate meaningful stimuli. Nod was perhaps never destined to be graced by native intelligence, 
even if it remained unspoiled by a wider human populace. Boltiel's money was on the swift flyers, but they weren't common, and capturing one intact was a tricky prospect. Presumably they must come to land somewhere, but thus far they haven't tracked one to its roost. Other than that, even the complex environment of the tidal marsh seemed to have produced only dull creatures of insensate instinct. And yet, there had been the tortoise dance. It was a recording Lortice had made when he went out with a repair unit to recover a glitchy remote. Nine of the three-foot-tall shelled creatures, listed as species three in their database and a major part of Lante's neurology study, had been standing in a ring, their rims almost touching. They had swayed, one way, then the other, coordinated, their arms emerging from within their carapaces to wave and twine together, and then withdraw. Was it a mating ritual? Were they diseased? The bizarre display had brought the lumbering things to Boltiel's attention anyway. They were the giants of the marsh, relatively speaking, but he had seen them as sedate grazers, the snails of an alien shore. Now, and in the absence of a flyer to study, they had become a point of particular interest. He sorted through the submitted pages of the neurology archive, tidying up where the automatic librarian systems had made errors, some of which were the result of shoddy coding and tagging by his colleagues. Next up was... Next up was a signal from Senkovi, the first in days. Boltiel opened a channel, knowing the signal delay would let him keep working in the gaps of their conversation. Hey boss! Senkovi sounded manic, which was probably a good sign. Dizra. So, uh, those sensors along the fault line we were having trouble with, Senkovi opened with. Boltiel sent back a non-committal sound, having found a narrative of a flyby over the inner desert that had somehow been logged by Lortis as biochemistry. The Damascus project had run into a series of technical hitches, mostly because nobody had tried to regulate the chemistry and ecology of just that much virgin ocean before, and Senkovi had ended up turning out kit from the workshops that was a little on the cheap and cheerful side. Now that kit had been in place long enough for the cracks to show, and he was frantically trying to get everything repaired or replaced before whole sections of the planet stopped reporting to him. Ha, yes, half fixed, the rest on their way, so that's all right. Senkovi had obviously worked out that a non-committal noise was all he was getting. That's good. Senkovi really must be in a manic mood. Does that mean you don't need Rani to help with the remote work? And then, speaking over Senkovi's response as the delay tripped him up, does that mean your mollusk diagnostics worked out? Senkovi was silent for longer than the signal gap as he worked out what to answer, and then silent a little longer, so that Boltiel was already cued to pick up the twitchiness in his voice when he finally spoke. Actually, no remotes needed. They... They fixed it. Yusuf. Boltiel paused, about to delve into the murky depths of the Northern Reproduction Archive. What? Because that had been the plan, of course, to use the damn octopodes as aquatic crew, because Senkabi had sworn it was possible. Only he had tried and failed to demonstrate any such thing in the Aegean's tanks. He had called everyone, full of his own prowess, presenting his mollusks with a virtual simulation of the trashed equipment they would be working with. Boltiel remembered the event with exquisite embarrassment. The mollusks had investigated the interface, moving things around in virtual space in a desultory manner, but there had been not a hint that anything Senkovi taught them had stuck. The whole exercise had dragged on unnecessarily until Boltiel had overruled the man and brought an end to the entire sorry affair. The little monsters had been sent down fitted with surveillance gear and hopefully trained to be curious about the malfunctioning kit so they would go take a look at it. I, uh... And now Boltiel was beginning to process the mixture of unease and elation in his colleague's voice. Yes, they went down and just did it. Diagnosed the faults, patched them, everything's working again. For how long, I don't know. I mean, not all of them actually got to work, but 50% of the pairs were sent down. They just... Yusuf, I'm going to admit something now. I don't really understand it. He didn't seem distressed by the admission. In the lab, I gave them every chance to show that they understood the job, you know, and nothing. It was like they'd forgotten the first thing about learning anything. But now they're down there, and they're fixing things. As though all that technical stuff was in there somewhere, but... 
an exasperated noise. They've got 60% restored coverage along the vault. I'm trying them with new instructions. Old Hill had been running over the repair data. The work on the fault line kit had been erratic, unorthodox, not what a human with a remote would have turned out. Senkavi would doubtless sell it as his little pets devising their own solutions to the problem, which Boltiel was unwilling to accept. Not that he had a better explanation. Then something else snagged his attention. Hold on. Pears? Why pears? He brought up the specifics of just which pets Senkavi had been sending down the line to Damascus. Dizra, I can't help noticing these are male-female pairings you've been sending down. Now it was Senkavi's turn to make a non-committal noise, and Boltiel ground his teeth at the distance between them. So Damascus had its first long-term residence, did it? Breeding pairs of octopodes set down by Dizra Senkavi, patron saint of all things tentacled. It's not as if anyone's coming, Senkavi muttered after another long span of dead air. Lante's coming, with a goddamn chimera babies, Boltiel shot back, not as tactfully as he might. Tell them to build boats, Senkavi said, and closed the connection. After that, Boltiel felt he'd played cataloguer for long enough, and moved on to Lortice's latest recordings of the Friars. It was a weakness, Boltiel knew. They had a whole alien ecosystem, every part of it novel and baffling. Focusing on a large, dynamic carnivore was old-style human thinking, the same idolatry that put lions and eagles on so many old flags. Yet there was a strange malaise taking hold of him, and Lortis and Rani as well. Now they were here, now this was it. They found themselves faced with a great absence in their work. Lante had her breeding program, but the rest of them had an alien world filled with brainless, docile beasts. In the absence of the balance of the human race, they felt a lack of meaning to it all. The universe was no longer watching them. The data they were collecting was for no eyes but their own. And those who come after? Lante's work was becoming more and more of a good idea, for all that she was still wrestling with the practicalities. We will understand this world and its life, but its life will never understand us. And that hurts, somehow. Because we need to feel ourselves important to our environs and Nod has no way of knowing us. And so, unspoken, they had begun to concentrate on species whose behaviour showed complexities that might indicate a greater intelligence, some level of awareness of self, even if there was no brain to house it. It was a dreadfully anthropomorphic desire, but none of them could shake it. Humanity justified its premier position on Earth by its intelligence, but here was a vast and complex world that seemed to lack anything with thoughts as complex as a goldfish's. Lortice had set remotes to shadow any flyers that overflew the marsh. The creatures were certainly active predators with a high-energy lifestyle, something that seemed vanishingly rare on Nord. Boltiel settled back to review the latest footage. Flyers powered through the air high over the marsh with that frenzied flapping sequence of theirs. The up pole of their radial anatomy had shifted until it was forwards, and their flight was born of three pairs of hydrostatic wings being inflated in turn, a motion utterly unlike anything that had ever flown on Earth. The remote focused in on a trio of them, and Boltiel tried to read some social interaction between them, but for all his human eyes could tell, they were simply sharing the same camera's width of sky. A flyer stooped abruptly dropping from the air to tackle a mid-sized tortoise. Its descent was steep enough that its prey was unable to hunker down like a limpet, and the flyer's wings were repurposed as grasping, levering arms to get its victim onto its back, whereupon it flensed the luckless creature from its shell with a half-dozen claw-tipped tentacles. Lortice had filmed a dozen of these attacks, plainly impressed by the savagery of the attack compared to the sedate pace of everything else on Nord. And then, the last recording, an attack that went wrong. The flyer dived on its shelled prey, but broke off, floundering desperately in the air, as though its placid target had become suddenly toxic. The aborted dive left the predator on the ground, flapping and shouldering through the rock pools as it fought to get airborne again. There was no obvious reason for it, complex behaviour of a kind, Boltiel thought, 
clutching at straws. Behavior they couldn't fathom, though. Alien behavior. What had they expected? He stared at the wall. In truth, he was staring further, out past the horizon, out into the alienness of Nord. Notice me, he thought irrationally. Acknowledge that I'm here, before it's too late. Five. Such hostile environments, such killing grounds, and yet so strange. Word spreads until all of we know that here, here is something. As we generate and spend our energies, new patterns emerge, a dizziness and madness of chemical gradients that lead some of we to yearn towards this newness. Some of we touch their substances, encounter their new elements, learn their valences and their shapes, the folds of their curious molecules. Some of we vanish, never to be heard from. But we are we, and there is always more of we to learn from those that went before. Many of we are intrigued as to the possibilities of these new shapes and spaces. Consensus spreads. We cannot ignore this intrusion. Some of we will act. Six. Senkavi floated by the tanks in the Aegean's heart, trying to make sense of it all. Today, he was working with a new generation in an attempt to replicate up here what was still happening down there. His subject was Paul 58, of a hatching slightly more tempered by the Rus Khalifi virus than the last. Which makes you brighter, he told Paul, or should do. Let you make those neural connections quicker. Learning, memory, he stared into the tank where Paul clung to an interface pad, constricting it with sudden flurries of movement as he navigated the virtual spaces Senkovi had created. Like the octopi on Damascus, Paul had been given repair tasks to perform. A series of broken installations flagged up to engage his curiosity. So far, that curiosity remained unengaged. Senkovi felt as though he was performing a weird balancing act or playing some odd Tower of Hanoi game where to progress he was constantly moving pieces backwards. Earlier generations had been able to perform complex tasks by rote, but as he let the virus complicate the octopi neurology, they became less predictable, less knowable. I thought the idea of an uplift virus was to make something human. He sent instructions through to Paul again, resetting the virtual environment. I've overbred them, maybe. They're unstable. Paul certainly seemed to be having cerebral issues. The mollusk's skin was in constant strobing motion, flickering and dancing with jittery patterns as he became more and more anxious for no reason Senkabi could understand. Sooner or later, Balthiel was going to want answers. Just do this for me, he told the unhearing side of the tank. Let's just give them a circus they can understand, and we can go back to just you and me. Come on, Paul. Paul abruptly released the interface and jetted across the tank. His skin was raised into diabolic spires and horns, which normally meant aggression, but at the same time he was pale with fear. The chromatophores about his eyes and siphon pulsing with nervous patterns. Senkavi regarded him unhappily. I've pushed you too far, haven't I? This is goddamn unnatural is what it is. But they won't just let me sit up here and keep pets. That's not how it goes. Everyone has to work. And it'll be your planet one day, Paul. Or your descendants. Or the descendants of some other octopus that keeps it together long enough to have any. Paul had apparently got over his fit, creeping back to the interface. It wasn't as though he was ignoring the test, but within the virtual environment his presence went everywhere except where it was supposed to prowling around the edges of the notional space as though trying to see out of it. One of his eyes was always tilted towards Senkovi, regarding him through the tank's clear wall. And now, an error message had popped up. 
the system feeding impulses into his cybernetic implants that projected them into his visual field. Senkabi frowned at it. Error. Brackets. Restate intent. Close brackets. It was a warning flag he'd put in for himself, because he sometimes forgot what he was supposed to be accomplishing mid-code, leaving him with digital chimeras that did something entirely untoward. The system had detected part of the test design going off the rails and wanted him to redefine its goals. He began hunting through the nodes of the limited test environment to find out what had crashed. Error, brackets, restate, intent, close brackets. Yes, yes. He had been working with this generation of octopi for 17 hours and change, he realized. Time to chalk up another failure and get some sleep. User, brackets, Senkavi D, close brackets, error, brackets, restate, intent, close brackets. Just simple building blocks of system communication, the toys he used when he was building the virtual architecture. He hunted down where it was coming from. It was coming from Paul 58. The octopus had hacked into the limited system, its virtual consciousness escaping from the test environment to send a signal to him. Error restate intent. Test subject, Paul 58. Error restate intent, user Senkavi D. Just strings of identifiers, the code that identified him as programmer, the code that referred to Paul, and the error code he used to prompt himself if he was leaving the task parameters he'd set for himself. Restate your intent. Go back and remind yourself why you're doing this. Paul's eye was on him, that he was used to the octopi watching him work. They were naturally curious creatures. Error, restate intent. Error, restate intent. Subject, Paul 58. Error, restate intent. User, Senka VD. Error, restate intent. Senkavi and Paul looked at each other, and this time, perhaps it was the octopus waiting patiently for the human to catch on. Restate intent. Tell me why. Why is there Senkavi? Why is there Paul? Why? Why the test? Why these nonsense games? Why any of it? Why, O oh creator? Why? Ten minutes later, and Senkavi had scrambled all the way into the outer ring, the place that humans went and Octopi mostly didn't, barring the swim tank and some industrious escapees. He sat there, back against a wall, hyperventilating, with a bitter understanding of what sort of man he was. Because he liked Octopi, he did, but they had always been pets. Try as he might, travel as many light years as they were, he had not left that part of him behind. He had bred them, and mutated them, and played all sorts of god. And now they wanted to know why, and he had no answer. Seven. Gav Lortis had started his audio journal only after the virus attack. None of the others knew about it. Actually, Baltiel probably knew about it, because he took the role of overall command very seriously and possibly Sengabi had hacked through Lortis's personal security because he had no sense of boundaries that weren't his own. Nominally, though, documenting his own private spiral into madness kept Lortis sane. He was a team player, Lortis, always willing to pitch in with other people's projects, to do the legwork, get a sweat up on someone else's ticket. And he talked to himself, and his suit compiled hours and hours of his circular reflections. Eventually, someone would object to the storage space his journal was using, but not for a long time. Ortiel has me out for specimens again. He wants the tortoises if he can't get the flyers. Lante wants them too. She loves cutting the poor bastards up. It's like she thinks she can read the future in their entrails or something. There was a word for that, but he couldn't remember it, so he had his suit linked to the habitat system to hunt it down as he continued his careful progress over the salt marsh. I don't know how we ever expected it to work out. It was a recent revelation, this, and he was still feeling it out like a rotten tooth. I mean, they're all gone. Not a peep since the attack. Not from home, not from any ships. Narrating it to himself, hearing his voice breathy in his own ears, 
gave him a curious illusion of control, as though he was hearing the story long after, when everything actually had worked out, as though he was telling some notional grandchild. Except... Behind him, a hauling remote was following at a set distance, waiting for his signal. It had three tortoises in its bed already, aimlessly crawling over the plastic. More specimens for Lante to dissect. He stooped over another of the creatures. There were plenty of them. Scientific depredation wouldn't make a dent. Of course, people had probably said that about mammoths and bison and actual tortoises once upon a time. But right now, Lortis reckoned even the prodding nature of Nord was more than enough to overcome the efforts of four poor humans. We're all going spare, but so gently, he continued his narrative. It's like seeing something break up in zero gravity, the pieces gradually falling away from each other. But why not? The world ended. There's no force pulling us together anymore. I see Calvin, and she's constantly improving on systems, designing palaces, mansions, habitats the size of cities, lining them out with fail-safes and redundancies and... On a scale we could never build. Not the four of us. Not forty of us. She says it's the future. But she can't believe it. She can give us a virtual tour of floating cities on Damascus, of airborne dome complexes on Nod that have a zero footprint, where the alien life just goes on unmolested beneath your feet. And it's mad. It's all mad. The remote came at his signal, and he loaded up his latest victim. Is this what I've come to? Driving me execution wagon for brainless alien shanfish. But it got him out under the sky. It exercised the muscles. Better than staying cooped up with Boltiel and Rani and... And Erma, he finished the thought aloud. She's always talking about breeding a new generation in the vats. Only we don't even have the vats yet. And she never seems to get started. There's always some other thing that needs planning out. She can't get her head past the stage where it becomes real and there are, what, some sickly, feeble children someone has to take care of. She knows the automatics can't just do it for us, but it's not as though any of us want the responsibility. Give us a next generation, sure, but don't make us care for it. Senkovi cares more for his octopodes than any of us would for those poor goddamn children. The hauling remote always made the tortoises limp it down on the rock. Something about it said Predator in a way Lortice's human form didn't. It was a wide, flat thing on six narrow legs, and probably its shadow resembled one of the flyers, or at least to the weird eyes of the tortoise. Anyway, the other animals nearby had all fled, or were hunkered down enough to make it impossible to pry them free without killing them. Lortice continued his ramblings, stepping carefully around the pools the remote following at its polite undertaker's distance. And so, Elmer just goes on doing piecework dissections for Yusuf because Yusuf's the craziest of us all, because he just wants to carry on as though nothing happened. It's like he doesn't even understand it's all gone. He wants to study the aliens as though they care, as though anybody ever will. He thinks as long as he's doing his job, well, not even his job, but the job he gave himself before it all went to hell, that things are still okay, but it's all business as usual. He found another pool clustered with tortoises, some in the water, some at the edge, scissoring and rasping at the blackish clusters of fronds and spirals that were something like plants, something more like sessile, semi-autotrophic animals. Nord lacked hard divisions between kingdoms. Those plants would release swimming or airborne larvae to colonize other regions. Some of them would supplement their diet with just such microscopic flotsam. Others went through mobile phases in which they metamorphosed into something entirely more active. Perhaps the tortoises had a plant stage, too. Perhaps the flyers did, putting down roots in high mountain crevices and turning their wings to the sun. Lortis stood still, feeling the environment encroach on his mind with its very strangeness staring out across the lumpen, low landscape towards the sea, watching rain sheeting in across the coast. Really, Senkovi's the sanest of us all. I should go back to the Aegean, go swimming with his pets again. That was good. That made sense. None of this does.
a searing pain lanced into his calf. Dumbfounded, he looked down. One of the tortoises had honed a tentacle arm into something resembling a needle and jammed it into his leg. At first, he didn't yell or call for help. He just stared at the thing as it removed the prong, his suit sealing the puncture automatically. The tortoise seemed to lose whatever interest it had in him instantly, bumbling away and scraping shells with its neighbor. Then the pain of the incision was growing and growing until his whole leg was on fire with it. Poison. And yet no creature on Nod could have evolved a poison to attack a man of Earth, surely. But now his helmet display was covered in red lights, medical emergency signals winging to the habitat. Nortis swayed, vision blurring, his breath abruptly labored. He could feel a terrible pressure as his calf and thigh swelled within his suit. Harrispex. The result of his earlier search had been waiting for him at the edge of his attention, waiting politely at the edge of his mind's eye, to seek the future in entrails. He lurched forwards, wheezing, gasping, even as the panicked voices of his colleagues twittered faintly in his ear. 